Hello, everybody, and welcome to this event. We're really looking forward to um, examining heat for the second time and what a day to choose, um, the weather and um, new reports that are, are coming out. Um, we're going to start off um, with a little poll, um, just, just to take the temperature of the room, and we'll try it again at the end to see whether we've shifted the dial at all. The first the question is, is the UK heat policy sufficient to meet net zero targets for heating? Your options are yes, the UK policies are sufficient. Yes, in principle, but further reforms are needed. No, the existing policies are completely off track. Or I don't know. And in the meantime, the running order today is we have um, Professor Ford will be giving an introduction on behalf of LSBU. We then have our keynote speaker, John Saltmarsh, who is speaking to us from Bayes followed by Jan Rosenau, Richard Lowes, Laura Bishop and Amy Ritchie. And together we hope we have a very entertaining afternoon and will change hearts and minds about what's going on in the landscape today. So um, Dean, let us have, let us see what people are saying. Oh, right, okay, 1%, the policies are sufficient. Yes, in principle, 21%. No, the existing policies are completely off track, 63%, and 14% of you don't know. Well, the 14% who don't know, let's hope by the end of the day we will have a clearer view. I will hand you over with no further ado to Andy Ford. Hello, I'm Andy Ford, Professor of Systems in the Built Environment at London South Bank University. So welcome again to the fifth in the LSBU Climate Emergency Event Series. We're delighted yet again to be addressing such a broad audience. So many faces, old and new, turning up to really dig into the issues that really matter. LSBU, School of the Built Environment and Architecture, conceived and shaped these events in response to the declaration of a climate emergency by the UK government two years ago in 2019. We put a lot of emphasis on speed because this is urgent. Rising temperatures due to carbon emissions is singly the biggest threat mankind and the millions of species and ecosystem of our planet is a threat to life itself. We all know the built environment has to change if it's to eliminate carbon. It has to change in order to meet the UK's binding policy of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, or more pressingly by 2030, which is the target set by many of the UK local authorities and city regions who've declared climate emergencies. 2030, that's a mere eight and a half years away. So we didn't think we were going too far when we called our first heat event back in January in the middle of winter, the race to replace domestic gas in a climate emergency. We are indeed in a race to make a wholesale rapid change. We haven't really got time to do anything but make rapid wholesale change, have we? Now, six months later, midsummer, we're looking back at heat. And it still feels rather directionless. It doesn't feel that there's a sufficient urgency for such a pressing issue and for a major overhaul of our national heat and building strategy. And we're not alone in those fears. The Climate Change Committee today published two progress reports. Both show the UK lagging behind on its key goal of 78% cuts to greenhouse gases by 2035. Heat pump rollouts and low carbon heat networks both depressingly far behind targets. So targets alone are not enough. As Lord Deben put it, our targets are remarkable and have a, set a major example to the world, but the policy is just not there. It's very clear we need to step up very rapidly. Take, for example, the government's 10 point plan published back in November last year, which has targets for 600,000 heat pumps installations per year by 2028, that's just seven years away. We don't have a roadmap. We don't have the right policy network, framework policy. 
We certainly don't have the fiscal support for large scale change and nor are there incentives or awareness drives for homeowners to adopt new technologies. In fact, we're starting this race cobbled when you look at the cost of electricity versus gas. As things stand here today, about 23% of electricity bills, almost a quarter of the cost, are still made up of environmental and social levies, which includes the climate change levy. By stark contrast, gas attracts 2% of these levies. And of course, you can use the eco to help you buy a gas boiler. So, how joined up is that? It doesn't sound like a strategy for ending reliance on gas. So if the government wants to get on the starting blocks, tie its shoelaces, it urgently needs to eliminate environment, environmental taxes on electricity. We urgently need to do more to build markets and to encourage people to install those heat pumps. That is if the 10 point plan is any point at all. So market building is particularly pertinent. Massive cultural changes do not happen without stimulus. Markets do not just form themselves. The UK has spent decades of infrastructure investment to deliver low cost natural gas. And the UK heating system, more than any other EU contemporary, is almost wholly reliant on this single high carbon energy vector. Yet despite the highest engagement in climate issues in history, most consumers are still unaware that their homes are as bad as their cars or that burning fossil fuels for heating is no longer a viable option. Which means most consumers and indeed most gas fitters as it happens have little idea of what steps to take or what technology to adopt. This is too serious to get wrong. We are in a race to reverse the deadly warming of our planet. However, there are massive gains for the UK economy should the government choose to capitalise on this opportunity and truly support the growth of the renewable energy sector. Without that support, failure is probably inevitable. The future home standards require low carbon alternatives to gas boilers such as electric heat pumps in all homes by 2025. But reports suggest there are only about 1,200 qualified heat pump installers in the UK versus the almost 10,000 that will be required by 2025. Without a robust market building strategy, support for manufacturing, support for training and skills and a consumer re-education programme, any grand plan is likely to be hampered by a shortage of installers, limited domestic manufacturing capacity and a lack of consumer awareness. We need to get this project moving because if we don't, we'll remain a nation wedded to fossil fuels for heating our homes. So as well as the CCC calling for a replacement for scrapped green home grants, the phasing out of gas boilers, and bringing forward low carbon regulations for new homes, the CCC is calling for public information campaigns to explain to people the changes needed. Rear education is critical. People and their beliefs and behaviours must be at the heart of this transition to net zero because it's complicated. It involves a massive shift in the way we engage with energy, consume energy, respect energy. And this transition goes much deeper than arguing over which technology will win. Moving a nation from a centralised energy system to a decentralised energy system means there isn't one technology. No one size fits all. And that is a big message to convey. We as a nation have signed up to the commitments of the Paris Agreement and that bit was easy. Now, our biggest wake up call is the realization that our energy system of fiscal landscape and technologies and supply chains and attitudes to consumption don't just need tweaking, they actually need wholesale reform. So where do we start? Well, to help us understand, we're delighted to have today with us, John Saltmarsh from the UK government's Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, 
better known to most of us as Bayes. John comes with big picture vision and a strong sense of the systemic thinking that this sector needs to adopt. As Deputy Director of Engineering and Research within the Science and Innovation for Climate and Energy Directorate, John's role is to help decarbonize the UK's energy system by providing engineering and research backed evidence and advice. He is responsible for engineering studies, technical analysis and research, which provides robust technical evidence and advice to underpin Bayes policies on reducing energy demand and decarbonizing energy supply. He's speaking from a research and engineering rather than a policy perspective. And John will be show how debating electrification over hydrogen is a distraction from the real question. How best to move heating away from fossil fuels? We'll hear how decarbonisation of domestic heat is not an either or question. It is not this tech over that or cost over efficiency, but is in fact a whole system question. So please give a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, John Saltmarsh. Right, thank you very much indeed for that introduction, Andy. Um, really appreciate that. Um, I hope I can live up to expectations here. Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be here to open this session of the Heaters On, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from the other speakers. Um, before I start, I ought to say a special thank you to Pippa for curating this event and bringing together what I think is a really sort of good set of speakers that represent some of the diversity of people working in this sector. So thank you to, to Pippa for that. Um, as, as Andy said, my team's role in the department is to provide evidence-backed technical advice to support our policy colleagues in delivering the transition to a net zero solution. And um, I'm going to disappoint by not being here to be able to present on um, all our sort of detailed policies. Um, but hopefully um, what I can give is putting some of them sort of into context and then talk about some of the evidence that we are, um, we are sort of drawing on to, to, deliver these, um, to deliver these policies and where this evidence is coming from. Um, one of the tasks we're regularly faced with um, is to advise policy officials and ministers on the latest unicorn or the latest silver bullets that has been presented to the department as an answer to all their questions. And um, I guess the spoiler alert as far as this is concerned, um, unfortunately, unicorns don't seem to exist and there aren't any silver bullets that we've found in the domestic heat sector. Um, so we're really sort of stuck with what we've got at the moment and how we can go about using these technologies to the, um, the best, best, of their, best of our ability. So um, I'll talk to you about some of the research and innovation work we're going to be doing to inform our policies, but it might help if I give a quick overview of some of the key components of our strategy to achieve net zero, first of all. Um, Andy's already mentioned the 10 point plan. Um, this was published last November and it sets out the Prime Minister's 10 main priorities for helping us reach net zero. Um, within those 40 gigawatts of offshore wind, five gigawatts of clean hydrogen production and increasing energy efficiency in buildings and rolling out 600,000 heat pumps a year, all by the end of the decade. So there's some great ambition there um, and what we then published in November was the Energy White Paper, which begins to set out and puts some more flesh on how this is actually going to be de delivered. But there are two important documents that are still on the way. And um, you know, we're really hoping to publish the, um, the first of these, the Heat and Building Strategy, um, very shortly, really as soon as possible. Um, this is particularly relevant, obviously, to this debate. Um, in terms of um, it's, you know, how we go about decarbonizing heat and buildings in the short term. And you know, that's really the, sort of, you know, the answer to sort of Lord Deven's sort of points about um, lacking in, um, in policies at the moment. That's really where the heat and building strategy will come into its own. Um, after that, and again, building on, on Andy's point, um, we'll be looking at publishing our net zero strategy, um, which is going to follow on really from the energy white paper but show how we can make the most of net zero, sorry, make the most of the net zero economy 
um, making sort of you know new opportunities for employment um, and generating growth. And that's sort of really imp important because we can't afford to deliver net zero unless we can sort of also reap the benefits of doing so. And that's you know a challenge and sort of balancing balancing act that we have to deliver. So I think it'd be very interesting to see when net zero strategy comes out, what that has to say. Anyway, I guess I ought to start by putting the um, the, sort of the challenge into context. And um, you know you'll have seen a lot of this graph already, but buildings account for about 31% of emissions, um, and heat in buildings 23% um, of emissions. And if we look at sort of the homes or domestic heat then heating homes accounts for 17% of emissions. So it's you know, safe to say that you know, LSBU has picked a, a really important topic for discussion here. Uh, you can see below the five pillars of our current strategy as it relates to buildings. And I thought it might be interesting to put into context how much we have spent on tackling these issues in some of our major programs targeted specifically at homes, looking back over the last um, last five years, last six years, the last spending review period, because that's a nice chunk where I can actually sort of extract data. Um, so the first one then, making homes more efficient um, and raising them to EPCC by 2035. Um, the big thing we've been doing there is the energy comp company obligation. And um, within that, um, about 300 and beg your pardon, about 2.7 billion um, has been spent over that period um, uh, delivering the energy company uh, energy company obligation. Following on from that, growing the heat pump market, um, the renewable heat incentive um, has been our main policy lever for delivering the um, our growth in in heat pumps and renewable heat more generally generally. And about 660 million um, has been spent on renewable heat over this period. And of that, about 350 million went on um, supporting heat pumps. So those are the two sort of big elements of um, Bayes um, Bay spend in this area. Um, and we finally get into the sort of the innovation spend. Um, I won't talk particularly about heat networks because primarily the heat networks work at the moment is on non-domestic um, commercial buildings, etc. And it's also very difficult to extract numbers. So going on to the, the, the fourth bullet here on a robust R&D and innovation program to te test the safety of feasibility of hydrogen for heating. Um, here, tiny little block at the top is 90 million for the buildings innovation program over the periods um, that we're talking about. And of that, 25 million went to support hydrogen, um, which amounts to about 0.7% of the overall three and a half billion pounds being spent. Um, what I sort of interested to compare with um, is to be column inches of work that has been also sort of, um, newspaper and articles that have been written about hydrogen compared to energy efficiency compared to heat pumps. And I would suggest you'll probably find them almost exactly the other way around from the way that the spending is going. And, you know, as it stands at the moment, um, hydrogen is not an option that we could deploy at the moment. And therefore, the majority of the spend is going to other places. And, you know, I think that the, sort of the levels that we're spending on hydrogen to understand the problem are probably quite reasonable, given the potential upside um, and possibly um, it won't go anywhere. But you know, this is the importance really of, um, of innovation, is if you're spending multi-billion pounds on a particular program, then you really need to get your, um, you know, be absolutely clear this is the right thing to be spending the money on, which is where the innovation research comes in the first place. And it's why I think I have one of the most exciting jobs in the department in terms of doing a lot of that research and trying to set us um, in the right direction. So um, what research and evidence do we have sort of out there at the moment? Um, key document that's driving us um, is, as far as heating in buildings is concerned, is was it published in December 2018 and is our overview of the current evidence. And it details the evidence and the pros and cons of four different approaches to decarbonisation. So obviously low carbon electricity, hydrogen, bioenergy and heat networks. And there were two important messages that came out of this, which actually are all sort of hidden away in sort of sub paragraphs of sub paragraphs. 
Um, but the key point on costs is that most of the modeling that has been done says that the costs of all of these options are actually very, very different, um, very, very similar if you put in um, similar assumptions. And that the margins of error on these estimates are far, far larger than the, um, the differences between them. And that's really why the government hasn't simply sort of um, opted for one particular um, solution over another, because there isn't a clear cost difference differential to, um, to make, that, uh, make that case. And the second point um, is about the different solutions and sort of a recognition that no one technology can provide the best solution for everyone. And you know, to give consumers choice, um, to recognize different building types and conditions and different local infrastructure, having a mix of technologies is really, really important. So that's generally the sort of the, the key drivers that are informing our sort of policy at the moment and also informing some of the research, research that we're doing. So I thought it'd be quite useful to sort of address some of the, the interesting areas that we're working in. And um, I've got a slide on each of these really, setting out some of the, um, the, sort of the learning that's coming out of it and the, sort of the projects that we're involved in. So a lot of you will have heard of the, the Hyper Heat Programme, which as I mentioned is, is 25 million, really sort of exploring um, and testing whether um, you can actually heat homes safely um, with hydrogen. We've got electrification of heat, which is doing um, sort of similar issues around heat pumps. I think they're spending about 17 million pounds on that. And that's looking at um, testing whether we can actually put heat pumps into a lot of homes that haven't been, or home archetypes that haven't been um, um, addressed within the renewable, renewable heating incentive because actually renewable heat has um, installed heat pumps in actually very similar homes to a large degree. So this is looking much, much wider at that. We've got the Smart Energy Savings Competition, which is looking at how we can um, use smart meter data to influence human behavior and um, encourage the greater uptake of um, energy efficiency in homes. Demonstrating energy efficiency potential, which is looking rather more at taking a whole systems level approach to energy efficiency. Um, cost optimal, lovely code, cost optimal domestic electrification, which is understanding the trade-offs between all the different ways that you can um, use of, um, electrification to heat homes. And you know, typically we, when we talk about electrification, um, we tend to be talking about heat pumps. Actually, there are lots of different solutions there all the different sort of costs and um, understanding where they work best is, is quite interesting. And finally, on heat distribution systems, to understand how well sized our radiators are in, heat, heat in homes and how many radiators you're actually likely need to need to change in most homes to switch to low, low temperature heating. So um, in the few minutes I've got left, I'll just a quick sort of gallop through of some of those, a bit more detail. So the hydrogen for heat program, um, has been sort of very successful in terms of demonstrating some things that sort of three or four years ago we were being told were completely impossible, um, like doing um, gas fires, um, which now we have sort of you know, demonstrated that you know you can build these, and what it has done is to change um, sort of estimates for how much these products are going to cost, from someone putting a wet finger in the air to actually people demonstrating these products um, as far as gas fires, um, as far as ovens, as far as boilers and hydrogen smart meters um, and providing some good costing as far as that's concerned. Um, it's also done um, a lot of modeling and producing sort of safety cases for the, um, the um, health and safety executive to approve to sort of move on to sort of the next stage of trials to see whether this um, you know, is actually practical um, in people's homes um, having sort of proven the, the safety of it. So that's the sort of the high for heat program. Um, electrification of heat. Uh, this was putting, as I say, 750 heat pumps into people's homes. And the good news is that most homes are technically suitable for a heat pump. And, you know, actually the dropout rates from the, these trials have actually been pretty low. Um, uh, People were um, particularly worried about the disruption that was actually concerned in um, in putting in, putting heat pumps in, and that was one of the stuff that the you know, big issues that still got to be overcome. And there are also a number of technical barriers in terms of the space for the out, outdoor unit, 
um, uh, issues around um, in improving the insulation for some homes and noise emissions, which are you know all things that we've known about for some time. But this is helping to put some sort of actual sort of data around the you know the scale of the challenges. Um, and you know again, this is the good news. Um, part up participants who've taken part in this have been generally very satisfied with their heat pumps, particularly with the ease of use, the reliability, and the thermal comfort. So you know some really good sort of votes for for heat pumps in this trial. And um, you know it isn't finished yet. Um, we're still learning a lot from it. Um, but it's been, you know, really, really valuable as a learning experience. Um, smart network energy savings competition. Um, there are seven, no, far, five different projects that are being developed there um, to sort of change human um, sort of, um, consumer behaviour. Um, these vary from trying sort of gamification of um, energy savings through to um, apps to coach pe people on taking um, you know, more, more energy efficient measures through to community-based local energy generation. So, um, and these are all really sort of trying to build on the, sort of the smart meter infrastructure that we have now. Demonstration of energy efficiency potential, again, wonderful abbreviations. Um, the literature review is now published on this, which summarizes a lot of the current knowledge gaps. And what's happened up until now is we've really fitted, um, focused a lot of our retrofit on, on, on homes in terms of doing individual measures. Let's fit um, insulation in the loft or let's do um, wall insulation. Um, what this is looking at is trying to join up um, all these into the most cost effective way to, um, to retrofit a, a house as a system. And um, it's been quite interesting for demonstrating, you know, that actually a lot of what, what we had assumed in the past from um, single measures um, is perhaps not the best way of doing things. And, um, you know, we're also developing better modeling for the future. Um, we're testing a lot of this in the Salford Energy House, and it's enabling us to take a lot of the, sort of the, um, the other mo you know, models from around the world that are, um, very effective at modeling, um, say, the, um, the German sort of house construction, converting that into UK specific data um, on climate and on building materials um, to improve the, sort of the modeling of um, in-house um, in energy efficiency. Code or code optimal domestic electrification. Um, the emerging findings from this, the final reports going through its review process at the moment, are that actually there's no clear winner in terms of different electric heating technologies. Most of them actually have very similar um, costs over their lifetime. Um, and um, when you look from the consumer perspective as whether it makes sense to um, insulate, your, um, insulate your property heavily, um, and generally it's better actually not to bother with a lot of insulation to focus on draft proofing and to um, just of, um, save those costs and put that into the cost of um, your, your um, heating, heating fuel instead. Now, the interesting point here is that from a, um, you know, the conclusion from a consumer is not the same conclusion as happens for the system overall, where actually energy efficiency for the entire energy system is really, really important to reduce costs. And what we need to look at is how we end up with um, policies that encourage consumers to um, spend more than they would otherwise do so on insulation measures because of the importance to the system as a whole, because otherwise we'll end up with the prices of electricity and other fuels going up substantially. And that will result in um, optimum, the optimum solution probably changing to, um, to needing insulation rather than putting in a bigger um, heating system. So there's an interesting sort of circle there that needs to be squared off, but that report will be coming out fairly soon. Heat distribution systems. Um, interesting point here was that 17% of homes that currently operate a boiler um, currently have undersized heating in some home, in, in some of their homes. Some, some of their radiators are not big enough. Um, if you move to um, low temperature heating systems at 55 degrees, then only about 6% of homes all their radiators would be suitable um, without any changes to the distribution system. But in reality, um, you know, for the, the few days of the year where um, it's, it's particularly cold, 
um, that people are probably prepared to put on a jumper. And um, the more you sort of either increase the temperature or say, well, actually, we can afford a little bit of a um, being cold at times of the year, that sort of reduces the number of radiators you're like, likely to, to need to replace. Um, the, the study also looked at um, uh, how we can improve the um, performance of radiators and good maintenance and hydraulic balancing were found to be pretty effective. Um, and some of these other sort of performance and enhancing measures in terms of um, magic magnets and um, some of this sort of the, the water additives, um, the evidence was far less um, conclusive. But again, this evidence has now sort of been published and will be, be um, being used to sort of inform our sort of policy developments as we move forwards. So um, a few final thoughts then. Hopefully these are things that we can sort of take up in the, the panel dis discussion later. Firstly, we're really unlikely to see one technology dominating um, the low carbon heating sector in the way natural gas has dominated fossil fuels heating. Um, as it stands at the moment, about 84%, I think, of um, properties are heated by natural gas. And I think we're going to see a far greater spread of technologies um, as we move to low carbon heating, of which um, heat networks will form a, a significant part of it. Um, there's also a huge amount of in misinformation out there about decarbonizing heat. And there's an awful lot of simplistic analysis that's been done. And these are some of my sort of areas where, you know, I think, um, you know, you can point to a lot of the analysis um, and these are some, some fairly sort of obvious sort of um, assumptions that are sort of hidden, un hidden underneath, um, which sort of end up um, producing something that's really, really rather sort of um, um, not perhaps a, sort of a particularly valid res result. So in a lot of cases, um, you know, we talk about taking um, our power from variable renewables, um, uh, but then suddenly the analysis doesn't assume them varying over time. Um, uh, a huge number of this of the analysis assumes that we're going to still have a, a vast amount of storage provided in the system um, when we stop using gas, despite the fact that all our storage in the energy system at the moment is actually provided by gas. Um, uh, there are also assumptions that the cost structure for the energy system in the future is going to be the same as the cost structure for the energy system in the part or that we've got at the moment. And so there's, you know, obvious sort of examples where people will sort of analyse what they're paying for electricity at the moment and what some of their um, sort of discounts are and saying, well, of course, that makes, you know, electricity in this, you know, employees in this way, most much the best way of doing things for the future. And finally, the assumption that electrification means heat pumps, um, or for that matter, that low carbon gas means boilers. Neither of those are right. You can have gas driven boilers and there's an awful lot of direct heating um, with electric that, or electric storage, which is also very cost effective. Um, so, you know, that's just, you know, this is a complex problem and it's not amenable to simple analysis and simple solutions. And finally, you know, the what's best debate between electrification, low carbon gas and heat networks is really a bit of a distraction. Um, and you're going back again to the Vandy's point. Um, we've got about 15 million minutes before 2050. And that's um, 30 million homes that need converting to low carbon heat by this time. Well, I can do that sort of sum. And that sounds like about converting one home every 30 seconds between now and 2050. That's quite a lot to be getting on with. And as far as that's concerned, um, let's do what we can at the moment and not spend too much time worrying about are there going to be solutions down the line in the future. Let's focus on least regrets, but recognising that everything that we convert at the moment is one more thing we don't have to convert later. So that's my sort of thoughts. Um, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank okay. you, John, for that really, really, in I, I'm absolutely intrigued by it. Um, and we've had comments from somebody saying the, the slides are so good. Could we please send those out with the um, uh, with the video that we, we send out a, a week after the event? I think they're so valuable. And I, I was just jotting down notes um, and really, really intrigued by them. Um, thank you so much for that um, really important, Pleasure. important um, analysis. Now, we move on to Jan Rosenau, who has been a speaker with us before, 
Um, Jan is going to be talking about pumping policy for a heat pump transition. Jan um, is a director at the Regulatory Assistance Project, or RAP, which is an independent, non-partisan, non-governmental organization dedicated to accelerating the transition to a clean, reliable, and efficient heat future. As the director of their European programs, Dr. Jan Rose now leads RAP's initiatives in Europe on power, market design, and efficiency first. He is also an honorary research associate at Oxford University's renowned Environmental Change Institute and has authored more than 70 publications in the form of peer-reviewed papers, technical reports, conference papers, and has also served as an expert witness to the House of Commons. There is nothing this man has not touched. He's also an avid tweeter. Follow him, please. Um, so, Jan, over to you for the pumping policy for a heat pump transition. Thanks, Pippa. So I just had to find the unmute button there, which was hidden behind my um, my slides. Um, so thanks, thanks, John, also for the introduction. Uh, I think your last line was a really good opener for my presentation. Uh, you, you said everything we do now, we don't have to convert later on, and um, we have to get on with doing what is um, you know, least regret and made progress. Uh, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think the last decade was really um, characterized by you know, a debate between experts about the right technology mix and the right policies. And this decade needs to be characterized when we look back in 10 years um, by having, having done some of this, having made inroads and brought, bringing down emissions. The day for this event is so timely. I mean, the, the CCC released its report um, just this morning and there have been um, several elements in it that are relevant for this topic, uh, decarbonizing heating. Um, I will not cover that in my presentation, but I just wanted to flag that um, because the CCC actually calls on the government to come up um, with a more holistic um, policy framework to meet the ambition uh, and deliver. Um, so I hope to provide a bit of clarity uh, on that question, looking at heat pumps specifically. I do not engage in a discussion of whether heat pumps are better or worse than any of the other technologies. Um, I just take the 600,000 um, heat pumps per year by 2028 as, as a sort of given target the government set itself. And what we've done in, in this report that I will draw on is essentially to, to sketch out how we can get there. So that's going to be the focus of my presentation. And of course, these things are never uh, straightforward. Um, you know, it looks a bit like this. Um, we know where we need to get, but we don't know quite how we're going to get there. Um, you know, the road is winding up the mountain, but you never quite see what's behind the next bend of the, of the road. But ultimately, we're going to find out. Um, and I think we know some of the things we need to do uh, to be able to do that. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, you know, essentially three main pillars of a policy proposal that we put together. But let me start very briefly with a challenge we have in front of us. Um, so the scale of conversion that we need to see according to the CCC, I know the government has slightly different figures, but this is what the CCC believes is needed, looks like this. Uh, so you have a trajectory um, of heat pump deployment that goes up very, very steeply. Uh, and the important takeaway here is that the next decade, um, we need to do some of this already to bring, bring the market up to scale. And also very importantly, according to the CCC, some of this will need to be done in existing homes on the gas grid. Uh, and that of course is an important takeaway because uh, if we convert it to hydrogen, uh, then um, you know, some of those homes will need to be converted earlier uh, to heat pumps um, if we follow the CCC's analysis here. Um, but currently we have a very significant policy gap. This graphic uh, is credited to one of my um, colleagues at E3G, Pedro Gertler, who has painstakingly added up all the figures. So this shows you the heat pumps deployed under current policies um, planned and also the heat pumps needed under the government's target or under the CCC's, um, uh, yeah, their, their projections essentially. And you see the gap between the two is very, very sizable. Uh, and it needs to be bridged, something needs to come in uh, to bridge that gap. And that's what I'm gonna focus on in the next few minutes I have. So what is, what is the basis for our analysis? Very, very briefly, because I don't have enough time to go into any detail here. But very briefly, we looked at what worked elsewhere. There are several countries uh, in the world that have actually done this very successfully. Uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark come to mind, but there are others as well, uh, Finland. Uh, and how have they achieved it? Well, they have uh, you know, put in place a very well-coordinated set of policies. They have policy stability over many years. 
there's sufficient financial support for people to actually make the investments. And finally, they have put a lot of emphasis on the skills and consumer awareness, uh, actually similar to what Bayes is currently exploring in some of the trials. So that's a very important element. And secondly, um, we looked at some of the principles that we think are very important in designing policy. Fairness is very important, clearly, to make sure it's not just a project for you know, the well-off. Uh, transparency and making sure what is being done on the policy side aligns with the carbon budget. A need for speed. Again, John said this before, but we need to get going. We, we can't you know, spend another 10 years debating what is the right technology. Having a level playing field that actually enables the different technologies to play a role and enables heat pumps to compete. And then finally, having some degree of flexibility and coherence in the governments that governance that is going to uh, be set around the policy framework. So what's our proposal? Uh, it's actually pretty simple and it's nothing that should surprise you, uh, but currently we don't have that clarity and, and that's, this is what we're asking for. So essentially to get to a heat pump mass market, which what the 600,000 you know, units per year would represent, we believe you need three um, key ingredients. One is at least in the next sort of 10 to 15 years, significant financial support. John mentioned the RHI. We believe we need something that is much more significant uh, and provides uh, financial support, especially for the poorest. Uh, and then secondly, structural incentives. That goes back to Andy's point. Some of the incentives we currently have with levies being put on electricity are actually standing in the way of incentivizing people to switch. And then finally, we need some form of regulatory backstop uh, you know, at which point it will no longer be possible to install a fossil heating system uh, that should probably be set at some point in the early 2030s um, because uh, the lifetime of a heating system is, is, is around 15 to 20 years and you can work backwards from 2050 when we need to be at net zero. All underpinned by a strong governance framework. I now we'll talk very briefly about each element and then conclude. So let me start with the financial support that we will need um, and then uh, turn to the structural incentives and the regulation. So this is what the uh, trajectory that the CCC have put together actually looks like. It's an S curve, as you would expect, as a typical market transformation curve will look like. Initially, we think financial support will be very important, but over time, as costs come down, and they will need to come down, that support can uh, go away eventually, uh, first for the able to pay, then for those who are on lower incomes. And the structural incentives will be there um, throughout. So they need to be put in place early on, but they will stay in place throughout. And regulation kicks in at a later stage, but needs to be announced very well in advance so people can plan for it. And the market can get ready. Financial support, um, how much will be needed? Well, we have um, run the numbers um, based on the CCC's trajectory, and we believe um, about three billion pounds per year um, by 2030, um, every year will be needed. But that curve then comes down as costs decline uh, through innovation. Um, that, that is what we think will be needed. And just to make sure that we understand what that um, equates to, we put an illustrative carbon tax revenue here with a progressively tightened carbon tax at a very modest level. There's more in the report that we've written if you want to interrogate those numbers a little further. You will see from this graphic that a lot of the money, at least in the early years, is for low income occupiers, we think that's important uh, to make sure there's buy-in for the policy and that it's fair. Secondly, structural incentives, coming back to the levies point, currently, uh, financially, it makes um, little sense to, to install a heat pump um, when you compare it to a gas boiler. That's because of the higher upfront costs, but also because the running costs um, of a heat pump are currently certainly not a lot lower than a gas boiler, maybe even higher depending on the installation. Uh, and that could be changed by shifting some of the levies to gas or maybe into general taxation or having a modest carbon tax. But you st still see from these numbers that it's going to be challenging simply by moving the levies away or having a modest carbon tax to get to cost parity. So what we need is a change in the costs of heat pumps. Some companies have said they think they can bring those down by um, you know, 40 or even 50%, uh, which would make a huge difference, but we're not there yet and we need to see um, how that process um, unfolds. However, um, and this is something I do myself and also Richard does, um, you can have a time varying tariff already today and that changes things dramatically. You could actually make heat pumps cost competitive by just shifting 50% of the levies to gas uh, and switching to a, a time of use tariff. Uh, which we assume will be about 10 pence per kilowatt hour. 
And of course, you could say, if everybody did that, those tariffs would disappear. But at least in the foreseeable future, we will have opportunities uh, for customers to do that. And there are several offers already that people can take advantage of. Here's a demonstration how I do this in my own home. You can see the tariff in the blue line here on a typical um, February day. And you can see in red how the consumption of the heat pump uh, performs. And you can see how I avoid the peak hours during four to seven, and that results in a net saving um, of about um, 34 to 40% right now, simply by shifting consumption patterns um, around. Finally, and this is my last slide, there needs to be some form of backstop. Um, we've seen maybe some of the reporting this morning in the Daily Mail, which was very unfortunate, where there was talk about a 2025 um, ban of all gas boilers. They would be ripped out. And of course, that is not true at all. Uh, the government has considered 2025 for new homes to be low carbon. It's not about banning boilers. It's about actually making sure we switch to low carbon heating. Um, and the government is currently looking into uh, a, a, some sort of installation ban of fossil heating systems probably in the mid 2030s. Um, and we think that is very much needed to give that clarity um, to the market um, and to the um, to, to, to end users. Uh, so that's it. Um, I hope I, I uh, wasn't going over time and I look forward to the discussion um, later on in the panel. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Jan, for that. Very, very interesting and lots of food for thought. Um, we move on to Richard and Richard Lowe's um, is going to talk about holes and heroes, learning from others to fill the UK's heat chasm. Now, Richard is a researcher and lecturer and he has a passion for sustainable energy and energy policy. And that's very evident in the work that he, he produces and, and the papers he writes. He originally worked in the energy industry um, on the other side. <laughs> in, he, he, he informed us earlier on. Um, although since 2014, he's been based in the University of Exeter's Energy Policy Group and he develops expertise around clean heating. As well as being uh, appearing before the Bayes Committee inquiry into domestic heat in February of this year at the 2020 UK Citizens Assembly on Climate Change, Richard was invited to advocate for the importance of heat electrification for us to reach those net zero goals. So with no further ado, I shall hand you over to Richard and hear what he has to say. Many thanks, Pippa, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm just going to sort my screens out. That looks okay. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, well, hi everyone. Um, I thought I'd take today's um, opportunity to to give some ideas of where I think the biggest holes really are in in current UK strategy and policy for heating, um, and then think about where some of the best opportunities are that we can learn from um, in other places around the world, and just from other examples. Um, so, um, before I go on, I'll set the scene. I think so. Uh, this is the climate emergency series from LSBU, which I think is a great series to have, and it's wonderful to be able to speak at an event that's so practical and hands on. Um, I think the first thing to say is that um, when there's an emergency, there, there are a few things that you do. Um, we know what the tools are now. So um, we do know the technologies that you can use to decarbonize heating. Um, and we've been doing energy system modeling for years. So we know roughly what we think, or we know quite well what we think a cost effective path looks like based on our current knowledge. Um, I do agree with John, we, we don't know everything. Um, we haven't been thinking about heat in the right way for many years, um, but we, we do know the different technologies that look to, to play an important role. So um, the graph on the right hand side uh, was used, it was produced by Element Energy um, and it supported the Commission on Climate Change's sixth carbon budget reports. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, the split down of different heating technologies um, by um, number uh, in the existing housing stock. Um, so this is just the existing housing stock. And what you can really see there at the bottom, and I can hover my cursor, hopefully you can see that, is that under their cost-effective scenario of 2050, air source heat pumps dominate. Um, there are a, a huge number, a huge growth in ground source heat pumps as well, um, a similar size growth in heat networks, um, and also potential for hybrid heat pump systems, um, which use heat pumps plus some sort of um, gas boiler. Um, although those are geographically specific, so likely to be in areas um, where there is hydrogen production, so primarily around industrial centres, because that's where it seems obvious that the hydrogen might be. So, so we sort of know what to do in terms of technology. Um, it's now a matter of planning it, um, which we don't do, um, and then sort of administering it applying it, delivering it, 
um, and coordinating it. Um, and I'll, I'll agree with John um, quite strongly that from a deployment perspective in the short term, so in terms of what we deploy to households, we sort of have to ignore hydrogen um, because it doesn't fit in with emergency timescales at the moment um, and we don't know what it can do. But I also totally agree that we need to keep our eyes open to it because if there's anything that can help us reach our climate change targets more quickly, um, we need to be aware of that and able to pivot to it um, if we can. Um, but roughly the emergency response, we know what to do, we just sort of need to do it now. So in terms of the actual um, policy chasm, um, there are three things I want to highlight. So uh, Jan just talked about heat pumps. Um, I will say there is a huge gap in terms of heat dump heat pump deployment, which I think the report that Jan talked about that I also contributed to um, looks to fill in. Um, but there is a huge gap. Deployment is well off where it needs to be, as the Committee on Climate Change pointed out earlier. Um, and there is a huge amount of work to do there around heat pumps. We're simply not deploying them at the number that we need to to get to net zero by 2050. On energy efficiency, um, the, the situation is actually quite dire, really. Um, following the uh, creation of the Green Deal and also the cuts to eco, there was a huge fall off in terms of uh, installed energy efficiency. Um, so on this graph, you can see loft, insula uh, loft insulation installations, cavity walls and solid wall insulations. Um, lofts and cavity walls, which are one of the key uh, cost-effective energy efficiency measures for houses really dropped off because the support was removed and it's not been replaced since. Um, and that remains a massive hole. Solid walls um, are also lower than required. Um, and finally on heat networks, heat networks as I showed in the previous slide also seem to be really important, primarily in urban areas where they make the most financial sense. Um, and we're talking about around a tenfold growth in the numbers of homes connected to heat networks, lots of those existing homes as well. We haven't really had a conversation about that. Um, and the growth has been extremely slow and primarily for new builds. So the majority of connections, uh, which is actually quite small, so it's, this is a relatively flat graph, um, if you can find the data, which is, is very patchy. Um, but we know that the majority of new connections have been in uh, new builds. So there's a huge job for district heating here that's just not happening. So um, on to the big holes, really. Um, the one really significant hole is that there is no plan. So despite the fact we know what technologies um, can do this um, pretty well, there is no plan for how we deploy them. Um, and that is a, a huge hole. That's you know a chasm in itself, really. The heat and building strategy is still being sat on by the government, and we don't know why. Um, it reached the stage where it has been finished, and it's been sent around to the various different uh, cabinet ministers. Um, but it's still not been published, which is, of course, concerning. And lots of people are waiting on it um, to make things like investment decisions, to support council and local authority plans and that sort of thing. Um, really urgently, there's no plan that supports local authorities to, to do anything around this when we know how important local authorities need to be for the deployment of um, low carbon heat and um, looking at different areas um, and there's no requirement on them to even do any planning so there's really nothing there we see some leadership from some local authorities for example the gla in london um, and bristol city council but they're really working in a, a very specific and small framework that doesn't give them much freedom so our first hero then the Netherlands. So the Netherlands have always been a few years ahead of us on heating and um, they have a very similar heat system at the moment. Um, but in 2018, they released their climate accord. Um, within this, there were some very specific things about heating that have really driven the heat market in the Netherlands. Um, and this is uh, in Dutch, uh, this is the uh, heat section. Uh, basically, it says um, heat and building section um, of the climate accord. Uh, and so um, they actually placed a requirement on districts to develop plans and to deliver heat decarbonisation. Um, and what that means is that there, are, there is clear communication of responsibility in the, in the Netherlands. People know what to do um, and they know who's responsible. Um, and there were also clear communications around the sorts of changes that people might see in their homes and their neighbourhoods. We've just not seen that level of clarity um, and discussion of responsibility in the UK. Uh, they also banned fossil fuels in new buildings. They did it incredibly quickly, um, and that sent a very strong signal to the market. Um, there are some exemptions you can get for this, particularly if things were in planning um, or if there's a, <clears throat> a requirement for some sort of high temperature system. Um, but effectively, this is a full on ban and it sends a very strong signal. 
Um, and they've also made a commitment to further rebalance energy taxes away from electricity to make sure that um, the, the imbalance between gas and electricity is small to encourage electrification of heating where possible. Um, so we can learn a lot from the Netherlands um, and I would encourage a further thinking around the Netherlands as a good comparator. Our second big hole um, is that the UK market is fundamentally shaped um, to support fossil fuel heating. Um, and it does nothing to disincentivize fossil fuels, in particular gas, which is, of course, the, the largest element of heating in the UK. And so this is uh, a cross country comparison of per unit energy costs. Uh, we have gas at the top and electricity at the bottom. Um, and you can see the UK has a relatively low gas price compared to uh, the similar countries um, on the index, um, whereas it has a high electricity cost. Um, and this fundamental imbalance is caused uh, through various things. The tax there you can see, so it's not really a tax issue, though that has some impact. Primarily this is because a lot of the environmental and social costs have been loaded onto electricity bills. Um, and so with some tweaking, uh, you could go a long way to um, rebalance those things. However, that's not enough. And what we really need is a full market transformation for heating. Um, and so our hero for market transformations for heating um, is Sweden. Um, and I can't talk about heroes in Sweden without mentioning Greta Thunberg. Um, and there she is. Um, but Sweden had this very coherent um, long term policy to remove fossil fuel heating. It was oil um, and it, this emerged from the 1970s oil crisis. But basically um, it started through pump priming. Um, and, and then ended up with a carbon tax, which was introduced to standard on all oil sold. And over the years, this carbon tax was increased um, to a very significant level, so $168 per tonne in 2014. Um, and that's the sort of level that we think we need for, for 2030. So um, they introduced this early and they had a whole set of measures to go with it. As a result, um, the heat pump market grew. It was a bit jumpy. There were spits and spurts, primarily responding to policy. But over time, the number of uh, heat pumps sold on an annual basis um, has reached mass market levels. Um, and they now are a dominant technology in Sweden. So they've really caused a um, heat transition. So we can look at Sweden and what they've done with some optimism that we can do that here as well. Hole number three is that we don't have any coordination. So heat decarbonisation isn't just something that you can rebalance the costs on, although that might be an important part of it. Um, we will need stuff beyond incentives because there are multiple elements. So various parts of the energy system and also various scale. So we're talking about things at a national scale, um, a regional scale, a local authority scale, and also a street by street scale. Uh, and someone needs to do some joining up and sticking that together. Um, and we're also talking about different elements such as power generation, network infrastructure, buildings themselves, and of course, people. So I was thinking about good examples of uh, coordination. Um, and a great example is um, Switzerland and the Swiss approach to heat pumps. And so uh, way back in 1993, the Swiss Federal Office of Energy actually set up the Swiss Heat Pump Association. Um, I know this sounds quite alien to how uh, associations work in the UK, modern ones anyway, but they wanted to create some momentum and they wanted to create some coordination. Um, and this body has been going for years. It also had a testing center, a sort of build out and test center for heat pumps linked to it. Um, and it ended up producing this quality assurance label, which has actually become the, Euro the European heat pump quality assurance label. And so this has sort of created its own momentum, it supported consumers, um, and it's really driven change in the industry. Now, this is just for heat pumps. We need coordination beyond heat pumps because we need to think about local planning as well. Um, and we need to think about things like local heat networks and, and buildings level stuff too. Um, but I think this is a really neat example of how you can stimulate coordination from a state level. So how the government can actually go ahead and do this. And interestingly, I think actually one of the most valuable um, historic lessons um, of, of different bodies that can do this might be the gas council, which was the body which drove the deployment of um, gas networks and integration of towns gas in the 1960s, 70s. Um, and 80s because they had various functions um, which I will touch touch on later but um, they were a real strong coordinating function with real um, political authority as well. And finally the fourth hole is that we have no public engagement um, so there's no plan to actually speak to citizens about these changes happening 
it does seem that the media um, it, it remains to be the way that people are still getting most of their information about the future of heating. We've seen today how um, unbalanced some of that is and how uninformed some of that is. Um, decarbonising heat does represent a huge challenge. It's something that has to happen in people's homes as well. Uh, and so we know that people gen, gen, generally and genuinely are concerned about climate change, um, but people don't tend to associate how they heat their homes with climate change still. I think that is changing um, and they certainly don't know about the implications of heat decarbonisation. And so I was thinking about some good examples of consumer campaigns here of relevance and public engagement campaigns and I've come up with two extremely different ones. So first of all, our fourth hero, uh, it could be Elon Musk. Uh, so Elon Musk was extremely successful um, in selling lithium batteries to people. The power walls um, have been very successful. They've become status symbols for some. Uh, they're extremely expensive, so um, multiple thousands of pounds. They actually offer very little benefit to consumers. Even if you're on a whizzy time of use tariff like I am, it's very difficult to make the numbers stack up for these. Um, and they take up space in people's homes. Somehow Tesla have made them a, an item that people just want um, and people will invest in. Um, and it's not a, a, it's a similar figure of money to actually what a heat pump would cost. Uh, and so perhaps we can let the free market and we can let marketeers and, and consumerization help us strongly here. And I hope we will, but I don't think that will be enough. Uh, and so I mentioned earlier um, the uh, UK Gas Council. I actually think um, from a consumer perspective, some sort of national body would also be a real hero. Um, and the Gas Council um, could be a, a real hero in terms of marketing. Um, and this is the least sexist example I could find um, of a gas council uh, publication. And it's just talking about how you can have a lovely bath because of your gas heating. Um, so maybe we can learn from there. So just finally then, to conclude, there are absolutely massive holes in um, the way that heat decarbonisation is governed. There really isn't um, any sort of coordinated governance and there absolutely needs to be. I think I've covered some of the big four holes. There are other ones too, such as skills, equity issues, um, and so on. But there are many more heroes too, and there are people I wanted to talk about and um, but haven't had time for in this slide, but we can learn a lot from existing market participants and existing organisations. None of these things are that difficult to do. So none of the holes I've talked about are insurmountable. They look like quite a big thing together, but actually it's fundamentally about throwing some money around and organising people um, better. Um, but the only thing that can make this happen is political leadership because we need the policies and the governance structures in place to enable these things to emerge from that. Um, so uh, I guess the only thing that really make that will make that happen is political will. Uh, and so um, if you want to drive that change, you've just got to get on and lobby your policymakers. Um, and that's, I think, a key takeaway. So get in contact with your MP, get in contact with the policymakers, because I think most of us want this to happen. Thanks, Pippa. And there's some references here. Thank you, thank you. And definitely, definitely get in touch with your MP and sign the petition. I write in the box as we speak. Um, yes, there's so, so much rich stuff there. And it's really nice to hear um, that some of the, some, some similar themes emerging about consumer engagement. You know, we have had probably the greatest shift towards interest in climate issues and yet heating in homes is, is the very poor relation nobody really understands it and um, I've had a gas man round. I've got the worst heating system in the world you'd think actually working in in the school of the building environment with all these um engineers I might actually um do a little better on this front I have the worst boiler in the world and I have repeatedly had gas men round ask and I asked them very innocently should I maybe replace this with a heat pump and I love the, well, I don't love the replies, but it's really interesting. Oh, I wouldn't bother with that, love. Yeah, and all of the, and, and even the gas engineers don't realise what we need to be doing. So I think we've got a massive hearts and minds um, uh, piece of work to be done um, right across the sector and obviously across skills, which we're very much involved in in our research at um, LSBU. So um, we move on. It's, it's, very, very interesting to hear these different angles coming up with similar views. I think now we're going to hear from Laura Bishop, who is chair of the Ground Source Heat Pump Association. Now, 
as a mechanical engineer um, uh, with Meki, and um, she's a chartered kind of, um, mechanical engineer with and with with Meki, and a BSc in computer aided product design, and an MSc in renewable energy systems technology, and fourteen years with, um, with an impressive range of blue chip clients, and today running a successful engineering consultancy. It comes as no surprise that Laura plays a very active role as a STEM ambassador. Um, today, she's wearing her hat as chair of the Grand Tours Heat Pump Association and is going to speak to us about the recent policy developments, such as those proposed in the 10 point plan and the announcement to phase out <coughs> gas boilers from 2025. And whilst it's a given that heat pumps can fill the gap, and we've, we've heard a lot about that today, Laura wants to bust a few of the myths about the potential pitfalls of mass rollout. So, Laura, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Pippa. I'm just going to share my screen, just checking that uh, you can see that okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, thank uh, the, the people who have, who have just gone before me. Um, we do have a really similar message, and I'm really glad to see that. Uh, and we've spoken together on a few occasions, and this message is um, consistent. And if we keep on saying it, then we will hopefully make it stick and make things uh, we'll start to see things happening. Um, of course, because I'm speaking on behalf of the GSHPA, I am going to focus very much on heat pumps. Uh, I am, as an engineer, I know there is no, no one size fits all, um, but um, today we're going to talk about heat pumps and we're going to talk about plans, policy and blockers. So some of the things I'm going to talk about here, the plans and aspirations are um, things that we have seen already from Jan and Richard, but that's OK. I think, as I say, it's a consistent message. Um, so um, I've been working in the heat pump uh, industry for over 10 years. Uh, there are a lot of people I work with who have been in it for a lot longer than I have. But what I can honestly say is that in the last uh, six to seven months, we have seen an explosion in people being interested in heat pumps. And the reason for that is um, just, just to take a bit of a timeline here. Uh, back in April 2018, it's a couple of years ago now, three years, um, we had the clean growth strategy, which started to talk about the phase out of high carbon fossil fuel heating. But then what really started everybody talking was in November 2020, the 10 point plan, uh, Boris Johnson announced the green industrial revolution. And point seven talks about greener buildings and the aim. It's the first time we actually heard about this aim for 600,000 heat pump installations per year by 2028, which we've already heard about this afternoon. Um, about the same time, we had the um, climate change um, committee's sixth carbon budget, which specifically talked about uh, heat pumps and their balanced net zero pathway, said that by 2030, 75% of homes should have low carbon heat systems that are heat pumps to enable us to get to where we need to be with um, net zero. And then following on from that in December 2020, um, John talked about the energy white paper that was released and again reinforcing the message growing the installation of heat pumps from where we are now 30,000 heat pumps deployed per year to 600,000 units per year by 2028. And then we also had, it was in April this year, uh, the Future Building Standard, which talked about the uplift in Part L and Part F, uh, which is ventilation and heat and energy use uh, for both non-domestic and domestic buildings. And it was also the first time we started to see this uh, talk about a max flow temperature in buildings of 55 degrees C. That's been proposed. And of course, by making the maximum flow temperature 55 degrees C, you instantly bring heat pumps uh, into you know their sweet spot, 55 degrees C max, uh, lower if possible. And of course, you get a nice, um, efficient heat pump uh, with with those sorts of flow temperatures. Coming down from where we are with gas boilers, which is typically something like 80, 70, or 80, 60, to produce 20 degrees C in your house. So it's big temperatures being generated, but actually not very uh, hot houses. So it makes a lot of sense to go drop that flow temperature down. Um, and then I just took a um, Similar graph to, I think, uh, Jan had uh, shown earlier, which is uh, taken from the CCC report, um, which shows how heat pumps uh, are, are projected to increase from 2020, extremely low, uh, up to where we should be or could be in 2050, which is more than 25 million sorry, um, heat pumps overall, so it's new homes 
existing homes off gas and existing homes on gas. So, you know, the plans and aspirations are there, the ambition is there. It's very exciting um, and things are very different to even how they were 12 months ago. One of the big strategies that's been mentioned is one that we're all waiting with bated breath, which is the heat and building strategy. It was due out in May 2021. Uh, we're now at the end of June and we still haven't seen it. And I, we don't, as far as I know, have an actual date for publish, being published. But, you know, again, it shows that heat is massively high on the agenda. And this quote was put out by Baroness Bloomfield of Hinton Wardress back in December talking about the heat and building strategy being a key policy of government um, and it will set out immediate actions for reducing emissions from buildings, energy efficient measures, transition to low carbon heating and it's saying that it's very ambitious. Great, we need to be ambitious, I believe we do. But we're now in June 2021 and I put this slide in on Monday when I wrote the presentation and I've purposely kept the slide blank because as of Monday, uh, we didn't have policy, we had no policy. And this morning, as has been mentioned, the Climate Change Committee's Joint Progress Review was held and I attended that and listened in to what was being talked about. And actually this, pol this slide of blank policy is correct because there is no policy <laughs> still. Uh, so we have, on the one hand, we have a lot of talk, we have a lot of ambition, which is absolutely to be applauded. But on the other hand, we have no route, no route roadmap no policy has as has been talked about by other people on the call today so we're actually really no further forward from where we were in november to june and all the time that deadline that 2028 vision of 600,000 heat pots per year is getting ever closer but we haven't actually got anything to help us to achieve that so my view is and a lot of people in the industry's view is we need to actually stop talking about it and we actually need to start doing something about it so just to break things up a bit, we're going to have a bit of a poll now. So moving into some of the blockers, the challenges that we've got. Um, Dean has very kindly put this poll up on screen. So if you would like to have a look at this, the question is, what do you believe the main reason for heat pumps not being deployed more widely is in the UK? We've got um, lack of trained and skilled installers, lack of understanding, they're too expensive to buy, they're too expensive to run. Bad press. Um, gas is still positioned as the UK's dominant uh, heat vector or, or heat generator or something else and you can write that in the chat and I'm going to leave that poll up on the screen uh, while I sort of move on because I have only got um, uh, 10 minutes to, to talk and I can really talk a lot about heat pumps uh, so I'm going to move on but we're going to come and have a look at the results of that uh, when I get to the end of my presentation. I'm going to talk about two of the blockers that I think are the main ones that we find um so just gonna go forward there we go right so first blocker or challenge that i find on a regular basis that puts people off and this could be homeowners and it could be anybody actually whether you're looking at putting a heat pump in a school a hospital a leisure center an office block a new build of, of say a thousand homes these are the similar kind of myths and um that that regularly come up to stop people going forward with putting heat pumps in so we have things like first of all blank heat pumps don't work and it's interesting that pippa said when she was talking to her uh, gas fitters that come around they say oh you know don't really want to go from a gas boiler to a heat pump because they don't work that is uh, one of the myths um this is a big one heat pumps only work in new buildings i have an old building um that's 1970s or 16th century i can't have a heat pump Heat pumps only work with underfloor heating, don't they? Heat pumps cost too much to run. Yes, they can. I didn't get the payback I was expecting this, particularly when um, commercial RHI was around for heat pumps, which unfortunately finished in March this year and people were not getting what they thought they were gonna get back. My building is cold, which can of course happen if things are not designed properly. Uh, I don't have enough hot water and all my radiators and pipe work need replacing. So the ones in red on the right hand side they are the ones i hear all the time when i sit on webinars or when i'm talking to people and this is a major myth and i believe this is one of the things that stops people actually going ahead and putting a heat pump in regardless of what kind of building they've got all i will say for now in the time that i've got is if a heat pump system like any other system is designed correctly installed correctly maintained and operated correctly heat pumps can work in 
probably I'll say 95% of situations, regardless of the size or age of your house or your building, and regardless of what kind of emitters you've got, they can work extremely well, as long as you have good people who know what they're doing, doing the job. That's actually one of the other issues about trained and skilled installers, but we'll come on to that. And then the other big blocker, uh, which has been touched on by, uh, by Richard, is the gas and electric prices in the UK. They are stacked against heat pumps and stacked against electrification of heat, unfortunately. So this is um, a chart from Europe, and it shows on the left-hand side the uh, cost of um, electricity in the UK. And you can see we're down at the bottom, which means we actually have um, amongst the highest cost of electricity unit costs in Europe. On the right hand side, we have gas prices and you can see we're there at the top. We've got, we've got amongst the cheapest gas prices in Europe. So that means if you want to go from a gas fired heating system to electric powered heating system, you are going to pay more. And what does that look like in practice? Um, if you had a house, this is actually my house, which typically means about 11,000 kilowatt hours of heat per year. Um, if I'm on gas, I'm paying about three and a half pence a kilowatt hour with a gas boiler efficiency of 90 percent. I'd be looking to pay about £420 a year on my gas bill. If I went to a heat pump um, and I used standard day rate electricity at 16 pence and my heat pump was 350% efficient, I'd still be looking at, I'd be looking at an annual cost of heat of 500, over £500. Even if I increased the efficiency of my heat pump to 400% or a COP of four, I'd still be looking at about £440 a year to heat my home for the same amount of heat. Um, sorry, and I just wanted to say about time of use tariffs, of course, that is a great way potentially, and there have been some questions about time of use tariffs, but those are potentially a good way of uh, reducing your electricity bill, but it doesn't change the fact that uh, costs are weighted against electric heating systems. So uh, poll results, uh, Dean, I don't know if you've got any results from that little poll. Um, yeah, okay. So the main one, which I absolutely agree with, is gas is still positioned as the UK's dominant heat vector. 35% of people think that. I would absolutely agree. Um, too expensive to buy. That was another one, actually, that I didn't put in there. Um, but uh, my recent experience is that the capital cost and the running cost uh, do put people off. Um, if you look at buying a new gas boiler, say £2,000, we look at air source for eight thousand or a standalone ground source for about twenty thousand pounds of course yeah i'm with you it's too expensive to buy um but i do think bad press does put consumers off that's my own personal view um but yeah obviously there are other things like training skilled installers is a big thing but gas still being positioned as the main heat source in the uk is you know um the major thing that is putting people off going off over to electrification of heat so that has to change and that can only change as richard said at the end of his presentation with government leading the way to make sure that things switch over from gas to electricity so thank you very much um i'm sure there'll be time for um, um yeah questions and answers in the uh, in the session at the end um, thank you very much for that. Some some interesting myth busting there, and certainly ones that that we hear regularly, and um, would need to be um, dealt with. I think if we if we're going to start to really really build a market now, this last speaker, our last speaker, Amy, really thrilled to have Amy along. Amy is the policy officer for the Association of Decentralised Energy, and it became quite apparent as we were putting this event together that in fact the question isn't about decarbonisation, that the sector knows decarbonisation is there. The big question is actually how do we decentralise energy? How do we go from a, 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 a one-way system, an almost universal system, to, to uh, no, no one-size-fits-all and bespoke solutions across different zones and um, areas? So, Amy is speaking to us from the Association of Decentralised Energy. That's the leading trade association representing more, more than 130 parties from across industrial, commercial and public sectors. As the AIDS lead on heat policy, Amy works with the team, government and industry to identify policy solutions for local and national heat decarbonisation. She joined AID as the External Affairs Officer in 2019 before moving over to the policy team 
and before that worked in renewable energy, in offshore wind and in the Scottish um, sector, growing the profile of numerous sustainability and environmental projects. Amy, over to you to talk to us about decentralised energy and getting in the zone. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pippa, and thank you for having me. Um, hopefully you can all see my slides. Are they okay? I'll assume. They're good. They're good. They're good. Great. Great. OK, perfect. So, um, yeah, thank you for having me. As Pippa said, my name's Amy and I'm a policy officer at the Association for Decentralised Energy. And um, as she mentioned, we work across um, uh, different sectors to create a strong, dynamic and sustainable policy and market environment for a range of different technologies. So we work across combined heat and power, energy efficiency, demand side response and flexibility and, of course, heat networks, um, which is where I'm going to focus my presentation today. So um, as all the other excellent speakers have touched on today, you know, there's this perceived um, two horse race between hydrogen and electrification. And in fact, there's no silver bullet solutions to heat decarbonisation. And there's room for many different solutions to come forward, one of which is heat networks. So whilst heat networks are far more common in countries like Sweden and Denmark, and there are much more established technology there, the UK heat network sector is growing and the CCC estimates that heat networks will deliver around 20% of total UK heat demand by 2050. And as Richard said, that's a considerable jump between um, that and the two to 3% that they currently serve. One of the great benefits of heat networks is that they are fundamentally technology agnostic and can run off a range of different technologies meaning that they're fundamentally a sort of low regrets option for heat decarbonisation. So whilst the majority of UK heat networks currently run on gas DHP, we're seeing more and more this switch to um, air or ground source led heat pump, ske heat pump led schemes um, on schemes using sort of innovative technology to access local heat resources such as mine water and um, geothermal. Uh, of the 14,000 or so heat networks that are in the UK at the moment, around um, 12,000 of those are smaller communal networks and many of which serve uh, domestic customers. So in terms of how heat networks fit into this sort of problem of delivering low carbon heat at scale, we know that there needs to be a fast and massive decarbonisation of our heat supply if we're going to reach that net zero by 2050 target. And that will require substantial investment as well as structural changes and a supportive policy framework over the next few decades. And whilst there's lots of discussion about how we get there, as all of the other presenters have touched on, there's still a lack of clear policy framework through which we can deliver low carbon heat solutions and retrofit at the scale needed. Then beyond this national um, retrofit and heat decarbonisation framework, there's a key role for local authorities and um, 230 local authorities in the UK have already declared climate emergencies and they have really, um, you know, specialised contextual knowledge of the opportunities for low carbon heat in their area, as well as the opportunity to work with industry to build really strong supply chains and deliver high quality skills and training. We're seeing this kind of patchwork approach of some local authorities doing really excellent work in delivering large scale heat networks and retrofit programs, but that's not the case across the board. And in order to deliver at the scale needed, local authorities need to be adequately resourced and kind of work to um, a clear framework. And then of course, there's the role of the consumer who are so often closed out of this conversation and not empowered to make the best choices for them. And, you know, as we've talked about when the current position is that when a gas boiler breaks down, it's replaced with another. And I saw a study this week that was done by Vattenfell that showed that the majority of UK adults would love to live in a home that doesn't produce carbon emissions. And yet less than a quarter were confident that they would be able to pick out and pay for an upgrade to a low carbon heating system. So we can see that the current system is really fragmented and there's a problem. But how, how do we get around it? So this is where the title of my presentation comes in. And zoning is not a new principle and it's been used in pl planning policy for quite some time. But last year, the ADE published um, a sort of flagship report on zoning for heat and energy efficiency. And that put forward proposals for a framework that we felt would help bring together this sort of patchwork approach and build on existing approaches such as local area energy planning and energy master planning. And it would we also create a sort of clear responsibility for different stakeholders at different levels. The report was based on the principle that different local areas will have different uh, decarbonisation pathways and be able to make use of different resources to find the most cost effective solution for them. 
So for example, um, it's been mentioned already, heat networks work best in areas of high heat demand density, such as towns and cities, whereas rural off gas grid areas may um, be more suited towards installing individual heat pumps or shared ground loops, for example. And then other areas might have access to cheap uh, heat offtake from industrial processes or energy from waste plants, whereas um, other areas, again, may have easier access to hydrogen. And that will all depend on the region. It also acknowledged that different regions of the country are at different stages in their decarbonisation pathway. And as such, they'll be able to decarbonise at different rates. And this is kind of already an acknowledged um, uh, an acknowledged point. So the CCC have noted, for example, that Scotland will probably be able to decarbonise at a faster rate than the rest of the UK. Given uh, the AD's uh, interest across a number of different technology areas, we also advocated for a whole systems approach. So not just considering heat decarbonisation, but also the building stock of an area and the potential grid constraints that may have implications for an electrified pathway. So we need to get moving on low carbon heat and retrofit, and that means getting the right solutions in the right places, and a zoning framework can help with this. So based on our recommendations and the recommendations of others, government announced late last year that they would consult on the creation of heat network zones in England and Wales. So we're expecting the consultation later this year, and then we're expecting that a zoning framework will be implemented from 2025 onwards. The framework that's being proposed by Bayes will help to locate heat networks in the areas that they are the most cost effective solutions for the consumer for decarbonisation in a given area. The sort of methodology um, for uh, by which zoning will be delivered will be decided at a national level, but delivered at a local level, as I said, with local authorities and, and local energy partnerships playing a key role in delivery. And the reason that it's so sort of beneficial and we were so happy to see this come forward was that heat network zoning can help to level the playing field for low carbon heat networks by removing the option of higher carbon solutions such as gas boilers within a zone. It also gives local authorities confidence that they are pursuing the right pathway for them and gives them agency to make decisions at a local level. It increases certainty around heat demand and offtake surety, which is currently a big um, issue for a lot of heat network operators and developers, given that um, as long as gas boilers can continue to be retrofitted in, there's no guarantee that um, developing a heat network will um, pay, pay returns essentially. This in turn um, increases sector growth and signals to investors that heat networks are, are open for business. It'll also allow strategic um, direction of government subsidies. So currently that's things like the Heat Networks Investment Project, the Green Heat Network Fund, and then whatever follows uh, to be directed to certain areas of the country where they will be um, best made use of essentially. This then helps to build local supply chains, direct local training and create jobs and economic growth in and around zones. And I think when we're thinking about heat network zoning as a policy, it's really helpful to consider the current policy landscape that heat networks are operating in this country. So at the moment, heat networks are an unregulated entity. But in 2018, off the back of a recommendation from the Competition and Markets Authority, both the UK and Scottish government announced that they would regulate the market by 2025. So this has led to Bayes developing the Heat Network Market Framework and then the Heat Network Scotland Act in Scotland. And those two pieces of legislation will work in tandem. And obviously there are certain elements that um, are not devolved to Scotland, so they'll be very closely linked. Um, the frameworks, when they come in, will increase consumer, consumer protection standards for those living on heat networks. It will introduce minimum technical standards regarding the performance of heat networks. It will give heat network operators and developers adequate rights and powers, so equivalent to other regulated sectors such as gas and electricity. And then it will also regulate for the decarbonisation of heat networks so that we're meeting that 2050 target with low carbon or zero carbon heat. And then I've mentioned a couple of times how um, heat networks and low carbon heat more generally can contribute to a green recovery and provide jobs and skills. And something that I found really interesting that was pointed out to me recently was that whilst obviously there's been an increased penetration of renewables in our energy mix over the last decade or so, according to ONS data, the number of green jobs over the same period has actually decreased. So just decarbonizing our energy system doesn't actually necessarily lead to the creation of green jobs in and of itself without kind of targeted um, ambition and strategy. So the Heat Networks Industry Council, uh, which is a group of major companies who are investing in and delivering heat networks in the UK. Um, 
Last year, they put forward a sort of comprehensive ask and offer to government about what heat networks can um, deliver, given the right investment and support. And they estimate that around 20 to 35,000 jobs uh, could be created in the sector by 2050. And then you'll see on screen, I've just pointed to a couple of different reports that have come out in the past year that have looked at the sort of skills gaps that currently exist in the heat network sector and the various routes that people take to work in the sector. So when we consider jobs in heat networks, that goes beyond the kind of what you would think of in terms of the engineering elements. You know, we also need people working across finance, legal, project management, as well as considering all the different supply chain elements. So that goes back to heat pumps and all the different generation types that can work with heat networks. And then finally, you know, heat network zoning, it doesn't provide a roadmap for the deployment of all low carbon heat solutions, but it does provide an example of how we can design policy at a national level to target and support delivery at a local level. A net zero energy system of the future will have lots of different and interacting systems. You know, it will be electrification, hydrogen, heat networks, and a lot of these systems will kind of form islanded clusters or zones depending on the area and what's best suited to that area. So rather than continuing to discuss which solution comes out on top, I think we need to instead focus on the right solution for the right place and then tackling the challenges that remain to actually practically install these in homes and businesses across the country. So this means getting higher carbon solutions off the table, like gas boilers, and addressing the high capital and operational costs of lower carbon systems. So again, through rebalancing of policy costs. And I don't have time to go into it today, but I would really recommend if you're interested in the discussion on policy cost reform, checking out both the public first options for energy bill reform report that came out in April and also the fair heat deal that was put forward just last week. Um, so yeah, there's, there, you know, there's things we can do and we need to get moving. And all of this should be underpinned by a clear consumer awareness and engagement strategy so that they are informed and empowered to make decisions um, about their heating systems. So that's everything for me for today. Um, I hope I saw some questions in the chat about heat networks earlier and I hope this has gone to um, address some of those but thank you for having me and looking forward to hearing your questions in the discussion. Well, thank you, thank you, Amy. So we come to the very end of our discussions. I am delighted to see that we still have as many people in the room as when we started. So um, we have obviously been holding your attention. And I think this is the bit where it gets very, very exciting because we start to um, bring our panel back online and we're going to ask um, a host of questions that have been posted in the chat box. I have been trying to um, say in the thread, if you're in the chat and you post a question, I won't be able to keep up with both threads at the same time. It's actually as much as I can do sometimes to keep up with the, the many, many questions that we get posed um, from various um, people for the different panelists. So I'm gonna try and be very even handed and, and um, hand them out. And so I think the first one I'm going to pick up on, if everyone in the panel could kindly put your um, videos back on and your speakers, uh, but, but mute when you're, when you're not talking. I think that's how we do it. Right. So the first question on my um, radar here is from um, Ed. And Ed says, Richard and Jan, shifting levies from electricity to gas seems like a no-brainer, but very unpopular and therefore politically difficult to raise the cost of domestic heating, even for climate change benefits. How did Sweden and the Netherlands do this without the incumbent party bombing politically? Well, shall I give that a go, Pippa? Well, yes, you, you can go first and then I think we'll hear from Jan. As well. Sure. Um, I did answer it in the chat as well, but I can I can say the same thing because I think it's an important point. Um, and so so firstly, um, Sweden started this transition back in the 70s. Uh, and so obviously, politically, it was a very different time then, um, even in uh, the UK, the, you know, gas wasn't everywhere then. And it certainly wasn't as integrated as it is now. Um, and just general politics and social attitudes were different. Um, the first thing to say is that they're that there's no information from the research that I've done on the specific poli politics. Um, so you have to do some more research yourself, I'm afraid. But we do know that the initial phase started with grants and subsidy support. So um, consumer um, upfront costs would have been limited. 
Um, only then did it move towards carbon taxes. And over time, those carbon taxes were increased um, as the technologies became normalized. So it would have been a fairly um, smooth transition towards it becoming um, normalized um, with upfront sports first. So um, it wasn't as if the government suddenly went right, we're banning um, oil heating and, and we're putting a huge carbon tax in. It was quite a smooth process. And I think we've seen similar processes in different examples of UK policy. Yeah. For example, in, in, in vehicles, it would, would be a, a good parallel perhaps. Jan, you 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 are the man on the ground there. What 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 would your take be on this? Well, um, I think there's there's different ways of doing it, right? And we're not with prescriptive in what we say in the report deliberately so because it's it's politically sensitive and it requires careful analysis by um, civil servants who have you know, means to actually look at this in a lot more detail than we have. Um, but what I would say is that. Um, you know, one option is um, to bring it into general taxation, um, which is currently being um, not just discussed, but implemented in Germany, uh, where you know, electricity prices are very, very high, one of the, you know, the highest in, in, in Europe in terms of residential prices. And the, the current um, direction of travel there is to move uh, some of the levies, mainly the renewable levy, levies, into general taxation to lower the price um, of electricity. Uh, so that wouldn't have an impact on those people using other, other fuels. But of course, yeah, it requires um, the agreement of the Treasury, and that is politically always challenging. Um, and I understand that. But that would be one way of protecting people who are using fossil fuels and would have to pay more, potentially. Um, the second point is that, of course, you, you, you could also um, only exempt the electricity that's being used in certain applications. So if you uh, use electricity for heating, uh, you could say for those kilowatt hours that you're using for your heating system, you don't have to pay the levies. That is something Denmark has done. Uh, so in Denmark, the minimum tax now um, on, on electricity used for heating, I think is, uh, is just below uh, 0 0.1 uh, P per kilowatt hour. So it's, it's, it's very, very low indeed. Uh, and, uh, and that doesn't have the, the, the big ramifications because it's, it's a smaller share of total consumption. You know, the amount of levies <clears throat> that you don't have to rebalance elsewhere is a lot smaller. So you can make the problem a lot smaller by simply focusing on the marginal increase in electricity demand used for heating. Um, so that's one way um, out of uh, this, this big problem. Um, a third thought I had is, um, well, for the average customer, if you, if, you, if you tend to use the same amount of gas and electricity, actually it doesn't make a big difference because whether or not you're paying for the levies with your gas bill or your electricity bill, yeah, at the end of the year, you're just paying the total, total energy bill. Having said that, of course, over time, that is going to change. You know, if you shift away from gas, then per unit, that levy cost will go up. But in the, in the short term, at least, uh, and we, we're not talking about millions of, of people switching to heat pumps immediately. This will take a long time, uh, even if we achieve all the targets or the CCC's projections. So it's not a problem straight away. It will become a problem later on. But positively, some of these levies will actually decline anyway. Uh, you know, so the renewable obligation, for example, the feed-in tariffs, once some of those capital costs will have been paid back, the levies will decline. So um, that's why I said we need more careful modeling. You can actually dynamically model the impact of the levies over time, and you can model what would happen under different scenarios. Uh, so there are ways around this, um, but it's complicated. It's not easy. And uh, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for the civil servants like John who have to uh, you know, model the, the details of, of those policy decisions. Uh, but I think it's necessary if we do not uh, do anything to the running costs. Uh, you know, we will have to either regulate for a more expensive technology, which I think is politically impossible and very difficult for, for those people who have to use it, um, or you will have to pay massive subsidies to always subsidize against higher running costs. Uh, and I think either of those two scenarios are untenable. And therefore, I think there is no way around changing the running cost structure. But I think we can do it by, by being smart about it and not think about the entire electricity consumption. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, not too much sympathy for John over there. I mean, we, 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 we're here to give him a hard time. So, John, I'm going to throw a question to you next, actually. It was, um, this is from an anonymous attendee who said it was highlighted that we're running out of time to decarbonize heating. So at least, uh, least regret strategy is highly likely to, to not deliver net zero targets. Considering consumers typically only replace their heating system when it stopped working, we only have one to two chances to replace those boilers. 
when can we expect government to accelerate by raising consumer awareness, but also come up with stronger policy signals on a boiler ban? That's yeah, I mean, um, um, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a very fair point that, um, we, that politicians need to take the need to take the, the country with them or looking into another way, actually politicians only reflect what the country is feeling. And, you know, it's always been the case that um, if you ask people if they want better public services, they say yes. And if you ask them, do they want to pay for it? They say no. Um, and this is a debate that, that has sort of got to happen. Um, I would say actually that there is an awful lot more debate about um, climate change and what we do about um, things like eating um, today than there was, say, two years ago. And that's only only going to increase. And, you know, um, it's, you know, it's fairly seldom that you, you turn on the, sort of the, the radio in the morning and there isn't some sort of climate, climate article um, in the news. So, you know, things are changing as far as that's concerned. But it's not just government that needs to, ta to have that debate. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's other organisations as well that need to get involved with it. And, um, you know, I hope that the, um, the, the um, heat and building strategy, when it comes out, will actually start talking about some of the things we need to do in terms of um, human behaviour or changing, um, changing, changing behaviour. Um, but again, you know, um, we've had the sort of the comments in the chat about a lot of the things that are being discussed are politically um, very difficult to, to sell and very unpopular. And actually, the um, you know, government being seen to be the nanny state and telling people to um, don't eat meat or um, do you know fit a low carbon boiler or whatever it happens to be, um, they're they're not popular messages um, for any government, and certainly you know, not not the, um, you know, the typical sort of conservative government that we've, we've got at the moment. So you know there are there are some real challenges there. Um, I'm not sure I've necessarily answered all the question. I think I would certainly agree with you know the points he's making and yeah. we can certainly all do much more and but i think things are changing it, yes it's, I mean, it's a very difficult conundrum things are changing but there's no concerted effort to galvanize that support for for the, the climate agenda um and, and any any company would would run an ad campaign and capitalize on this pronto but but somehow the government doesn't seem to want to and the other thing is whilst yes it is a very unpopular view um, and 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 some of it's unpalatable. Not as unpalatable as climate disruption is going to be. You know, I mean, what, what's just that's further down the yes. line. We're talking about you know, you know, horrendous scenarios. So um, maybe maybe I don't know. You have to stop being so screaming. I don't know. Um, well, right. I mean, you, right. no, no. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know there is a big difference between the government telling people to do something. Um, through an advertising campaign or whatever it happens to be. And the sort of the, the David Attenborough moment we have with plastics with, I mean, I think it was the, the Blue Planet, wasn't it? Where suddenly, you know, the, the attitude for, for plastics that changed overnight. Um, now, you know, the government has been saying that sort of thing for a long time, but it's not, you know, it's not the government that captures the, um, the heart of people. You know, that needs to happen in some other way most of the time. The 5P levy on plastic bags. You know, sound, sound took a long, long time coming, but was a very, very, very successful, very, absolutely, very potent and signal. And and, and and I think I was saying to you, people stand at the cash desk now and apologise for why they're they're taking a bag. You know, whereas before they would take as many as they want. And it, it actually shows you that the actual attitudinal change is quite quite interesting. Um, I'm going to throw another difficult question out, and people only ever ask if difficult questions. Be kind, audience. Be kind, Laura. Why is it so difficult to get pricing information on how much an air source or ground source heat pump installation costs for an individual house? Yeah, I saw that one in the, in the chat and I thought, oh, um, yeah, it's a good question, actually. I mean, uh, for, from a consumer, from my cons as a consumer point of view, I think, uh, you know, depending on which installer you go to, because typically you will go to an installer who will give you a full package price. So that just won't just be the heat pump. If you go onto somewhere like um, 
plumb base website you can actually look for um heat pumps and they'll you know you can, you can get a price for just a heat pump on its own you can get a price for a cylinder that's fairly straightforward um but in terms of getting a price for the full install which is what typically you're looking for because you don't just want to buy a heat pump you want something to kind of fit it for you um it totally depends on the installer and as we are well aware there is a big difference in installers across the uk uh, in terms of everything from skill level to engagement with customers to pricing so um yeah all i can say is i agree it's quite difficult and you will have to go out the quote and having gone through the green homes grant um application process um, i found that i did get a wide variety of pricing and quotes back um, so i i I don't know the answer is 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 the is the is the answer um apart from the fact that you can get a price for a heat pump very easily but the installation is more difficult okay thank you so much so so perhaps as well as consumer um hearts and mind change we also have to perhaps look at some of those process gaps because they do become very very real issues when you're actually asking people to make complex changes um, and that's quite an area of interest um, in our research department. The only, thing, the only thing, so the only thing I would say about that is that if you are, uh, if, if you're struggling to find a good price or, or to sort of baseline a price and find out whether you're being charged over the odds or not, um, you can come to one of the trade associations such as the GSHPA, and we will be able to say actually they are really hauling you over the coals, or actually no, that's a proper price. So you know, we, we and other trade associations are available to do that. Okay, that's a, that's a very good point and, and um, something that perhaps should be flagged up more. Amy, I have a question here, um, perhaps you might be able to answer, um, which is about, you, you're talking about zoning and the different forms of energy um, that will make up the, the um, sort of uh, picture later. Um, what sort of um, support would you see for co the community energy sector to decarbonise heat? Um, because community energy could be a brilliant way to leverage quicker project development, community groups being trusted, they can raise investment quickly and have a lot of technical expertise. Is that something that's on your radar at all? It's actually not. I think um, the AD doesn't particularly touch on, on community energy, but I think um, re people like Regen uh, are. And I think it's a really good point. And particularly if we're thinking about sort of smaller heat networks, so like communal schemes, we've been thinking about how they are decarbonized and whether that's through things like interconnection within zones or it's retrofit of low carbon heat technologies. And at the moment, there's really a big lack of subsidy support um, for those networks to sort of decarbonize. So um, I think it's a really excellent question. And um, if if um, sort of funding can, can be aggregated and things like the, the clean heat grant could be aggregated to support um, community energy, then that would definitely be a good thing. Yeah. I've, I've got a questionnaire out at the moment on community energy. I'm just doing the analysis. And I think what, what's coming out of it is very, very low awareness of what it actually is in any event. So um, I would really love to see some sort of move towards community energy being put onto the table um, in, in, uh, in that regard. So um, let's have a look and see what else we have here. I think we're back to Jan and Richard. Um, I don't know why I have you as a double act, um, but um, Melissa Merriweather has asked, I'd like to know if the choice between draft proofing versus insulation for the domestic market is only about reducing carbon. Or is it also true in terms of return on investment for reducing energy bills as well? It's sort of a retrofit question, really. From the consumer's point of view, where do they get the most overall benefit? Is it comfort, cost or reduced bills? I'm happy to go fast this time, if I may, Richard. Um, well, you, it, it will depend on the property. So you can't give a, 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 a sort of answer that holds for a, a, every single property. What I would say is that um, I think John is right in what he said early on, that a lot of the energy efficiency measures that are quite costly, purely on a, on a cost benefit analysis, you know, you don't pay for themselves. There are other very good reasons why you might want to do them. Um, comfort is one of them. Aesthetics, you, know, you might want to change your old single glazed windows and, and put some triple glazing in, um, but you may never get the cost spec, at least not over a you know, short amount of, of time. You went, the payback periods could be very, very long. Um, they, it also adds value to the property, of course. And um, if at some point the government, and I think this is on the cards, is going to uh, put some form of regulation in at the point of sale, potentially, that you have to have a certain EPC rating, well, um, you know, then some of these things uh, start to make sense. 
But I think uh, purely based on the energy cost savings, you know, you would not necessarily uh, go to great lengths, uh, and it would be uh, it would be more advisable to fix some of the easy things first. Uh, and yeah, John is also right that you could just specify a bigger heating system. The question is, at what point do the two cost curves uh, cross over? You know, when is it cheaper to reduce demand than over specifying the heating system? Um, and that will really depend. And you need a really good surveyor um, who can who can look at your property, calculate the heat loss, uh, work out what makes sense and what doesn't. Um, it's not an EPC assessment, um, I'm afraid. You know, that's not going to go deep enough, uh, but it can be done. And um, and I think in many cases, um, you know, these problems can be can be resolved. Richards, do you do you, do you have a view? Any? Um, th thanks, Pippa. <clears throat> I think I, I agree with Jan. It very much depends on on the property and what the current status of things are. Um, I'd say say two things. Um, so one is that in general, the Commission on Climate Change, and I've asked them about this, assume that for um, a heat pumped or, or low carbon heated house, um, the walls are insulated. Um, so that includes the solid walls um, and the walls are insulated and you've got double glazing. So I think focus on the basics first um, and that will be good in whatever situation you go down. Um, and then on a, on a personal level, um, I, I'm in an 1895 terraced house uh, with solid walls, very typical. British house. Um, it has been fully insulated internally. We weren't going to, um, but for whatever reason, because the plaster was crumbling, we had to replaster. So it made sense to just put new insulation on, on the, the stone walls. And it's totally transformed it. And I've lived in um, obviously cold British buildings before I've lived in solid granite, uninsulated buildings. Um, and there's just way beyond the cost and the performance of your heating system you just feel snug and it's really quiet uh, and there are benefits way beyond um, you know how efficient or, or cost effective your system is um, it just feels lovely um, and that will never go into any sort of cost benefit analysis yes that's really interesting you should mention that because in the social housing um, research we're doing um, one of the things that we hear quite often is sound is an issue and the insulation does make a big difference to, to the comfort of the residents and the um, running issues that, that the social um, housing landlords have with sound issues. So, so there are there are secondary benefits that perhaps aren't I, I live next door to students, I've never heard them. Well, that that's a headline. That's a headline <laughs> having lived under students. <laughs> In, upstairs I very nearly killed them okay so um whilst we're on on the subject um of EPCs being mentioned um Tim Fenn put a, posed a, a question should we scrap EPCs now the better buildings partnership report covering thousands of buildings shows there's absolutely no correlation between EPC rating and actual energy use now I'm going to throw that to the panel who is brave enough to take that question on John, thank I'm, you. I'm happy, I'm happy to give that a, a start, and I'm sure some of my esteemed colleagues will, will come in afterwards. Um, but you know, the, the first point is that, um, well, it's not a surprise that EPCs um, are um, not giving you a good idea of how much energy you're using, because it's not trying to measure that. An EPC is there to measure the energy performance of the house. Um, a, um, the amount of energy you use is determined primarily by the behaviors within the house. And you know, um, the ETI did some work on this you know, some years ago now, and they categorized people into high, medium, and low users. And I think that the high, high users were typically using two times as much or three times as much of that energy as the, the low users for the same house type. And they then asked people whether they could categorize themselves as a high, medium, or low user. And the thing, you know, the really interesting bit about it was that no one actually had any idea whether they were a high energy user or a low energy user. And um, so, you know, this is the reason that, you know, if you simply look at energy use per house, you don't see um, you know, very much correlation with what the energy performance certificate says. But actually, um, you know, energy performance certificates are not particularly accurate. Um, we published a report on a sort of a mystery shopping of um, energy performance certificates about five, six years ago. And that demonstrated that if you go to three or four um, different um, energy assessors, you will get three or four different results. And typically they can vary by as much as two sat bands. 
which is fairly dramatic for exactly the same house, which is why we're looking at sort of alternatives um, and the Smeters program, which is looking at um, using smart meters to um, estimate the energy performance of your house as a sort of a measured energy performance certificate rather than a, um, a sort of deemed one when you send a man around with a, um, a clipboard to um, assess, assess it. Um, you know, it has a lot of potential um, and, you know, hopefully that's the way we'll move to in the future of sort of me measured performance certificates. But as it stands at the moment, we do need some way to be able to compare one house with another house. And, um, you know, the energy performance certificate seems to be a better way of doing it than not trying at all. So that gives a few people a little bit of a thinking chance to sort of come in and perhaps add to that. Who'd like to come in on, on EPCs? Anybody? Jan. Just to, to add to what John said, which I agree with, I think another issue with EPCs is that a lot of people don't understand is that it is about energy costs. It's not about the actual energy consumption. It's not about the carbon emissions, even though there is an environmental rating. But the actual EPC rating that you get is based on the running costs. And that makes sense from one perspective, because you want people when they you know, sign a, t a tenancy contract or they procure a, a property to know what it's going to cost them to run uh, the property in terms of heating and electricity. Um, but as we want to also encourage a shift away uh, from fossil fuels, uh, and you know, it's a current situation, actually you get a penalty if you switch from a boiler, uh, for example, to a heat pump. Your EPC rating may as well go down, certainly not up. Uh, and I think that is uh, problematic. Uh, and, uh, and that needs to be rectified if we want to do both at the same time. We want to encourage people to make improvements, but we also want to encourage people to move up the EPC scale because that's the metric that is currently being used. Uh, so I think we need to bring the two together in a, in a way that is sensible. Uh, and uh, again, it shows that you can't just do one thing in isolation. We need to get the whole package right to really um, have a compelling case. And, and does that come back to the, the core strategy of what these documents are trying to do? There's very low engagement with EPCs. They're, 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 they're a bit of a tick box exercise. I've, I've had letting agents say, I know someone who can get you a good EPC. Um, consumers aren't that interested in how much properties, you know, renters aren't that interested. Purchases, you know, it, it is all a little bit, it, it's a little, it, little bit of an academic exercise. Um, for the actual sort of end user. Um, do we have to really have a radical rethink here? Well, I mean, I think this, this could change. You know, once it's clear that maybe mortgages uh, will depend on EPC ratings or you know, the ability to, to sell um, or, or, or rent a house. Um, so this could really change perception and, and make it a much more important instrument. But if we did that, I think we need to also have trust in the methodology. So if you get you know, five different assessors in and you get five different ratings, that is not very reassuring. Uh, and of course, you could then see um, a potential for gaming where you can get certain firms to provide a good EPC rating uh, because there's a stronger incentive for obtaining that. Uh, and we need to be aware of that. That could happen. We've seen that in other, in other sectors. And we just need to be careful um, and, and manage that, uh, that, that, that well. Maybe just one add on, um, I, and I haven't um, validated this, I'd be interested in whether there's any statistics on this, but I spoke to a number of EPC assessors um, who have done you know, hundreds or thousands of properties. And you know, they tell me that um, the EPC almost never recommends the installation of a heat pump for an existing property. Um, of you know, typical house type in the UK. I haven't validated that. I haven't actually seen statistics for you know, a sample of EPCs, um, but that again, I think comes down to the running costs probably as the main reason for that. Superb, Laura, Laura you're nodding there. Would, would you like to add? I was just uh, reading some of the comments um, and, and Kayla and has put in about how she has actually seen EPC reductions of more than two points if you place a gas boiler with an air source heat pump. So that just you know bears out what what Jan was just saying there. Um, so and she's also talking about EPC gaming. But um, I was just thinking to myself, you know, is 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 um, there just a lack of? Does it does it reflect the fact that people are just not interested in the energy demands of their homes? That the EPC is just so inconsequential to them? I don't know. I don't know. Yes. I, I, in, interestingly, I. I found in my research actually that the, the um, energy sector um, has far more um, 
a higher perception of how interested consumers are in, in demand reduction. They're really not that interested in energy efficiency. And certainly that's borne out when I was working in the energy switch markets that, you know, tries you might consume. It's just very, very hard to get consumers to engage in this stuff. So um, that, that's a very that's a very valid point. We, we sort of talk amongst ourselves about these hallowed things and they're like not interested. Um, so I just want to raise the tempo a little bit and talk about hydrogen. I've got a couple of hydrogen questions here um, and I'm going to throw them open to the floor again. Um, the first one, again, from, from our anonymous attendee, who he seems very mysterious, this anonymous, I'm saying, I'm, I'm assuming it's a, a, a chap, um, an, an anonymous attendee saying, if the UK goes down the road of hydrogen boilers for the majority of home heating, but the rest of the world goes down the road for electrification, could the UK miss out on the green growth export opportunities by becoming an outlier in the way we heat our homes? May I come in there, Pippa? You may, certainly. <laughs> uh, so in answer to that question, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I think it, it would be a, a really bizarre case of British exceptionalism um, if we did that and the other world, the whole world goes electric. Um, the, the, the good news is that uh, Valent yesterday announced uh, their first heat pump line in the UK, if you've not spotted this already, um, which is genuinely massive news. Uh, because the other heat pump lines in the UK, and I can see Simon in the chat um, from Kenza, um, and uh, that's an important one down in Cornwall near me. Um, and we have another Mitsubishi line in Scotland as well for air source heat pumps. Um, but for Valent to do this is a really exciting move. Um, and it just goes to show the investment that can happen. Um, and also because we have such a strong heating appliance manufacturing base in the UK, um, it makes sense if we want to, you know, increase productivity and so on, to be producing the technology that the world uses uh, so that we can export it too. And if we just carry on making um, gas boilers, we wouldn't be able to do that. So um, good point, Ed, whoever you are, and it's very well made. So thank you. And anybody else want to pick up on that one? Or... I think just just quickly on the on the heat network side again. Um, so the Department for International Trade have a high potential opportunity on heat networks in the northeast, and that's about attracting inward investment. And I think just to echo what Richard was saying, that um, there's there's opportunities for import and export on all of these heating technologies, not just not just heat pumps. So yeah, I think we definitely would miss out by going down a single route. Superb. And then Richard. Hux, Huxwell Baldwin, there is such a strong push on hydrogen. It's mentioned 20 times in the CCC recommendations report compared to eight for heat pumps. What happens if the trials show that actually hydrogen isn't a good solution for heating? Jan, straight off the block there. That gives John I think. If, if I may, um, it, it just relates also to the first question. Um, I mean, the, the, yeah, the problem would only um, become a problem if we decide to wait until we have the results from the hydrogen trials and do nothing in the meantime. And uh, I don't think that is what the government is suggesting. I don't think that's what anyone is suggesting. So we, we need to get going and roll out um, the technologies that are already mature, uh, energy efficiency, heat pumps, district heating networks, uh, and we need to do the hydrogen trials. And if, and I think Richard said this before, if we then find in, in let's say eight, nine years, that you know, hydrogen is a lot cheaper to deploy than um, heat pumps and district heating. Well, yeah, we can still do it. It doesn't mean that we've lost that opportunity, but in the next few years, um, we, we shouldn't just wait um, and, and do more research. We need to get going because you know, for the reasons that John, John mentioned before, you know, every property we do not convert now, we have to do later. And then we have to do a lot more uh, in, a, in, a, in a lot less minutes um, than, uh, than, than we have now. So I think that that, that is the, the, the logical approach to think about this rather than we now need to make a decision it's gonna be one or the other um, and not doing anything in the meantime until we make that decision. I think that was the approach in the last decade, um, but that has really uh, has changed, I think. Yes, yeah, so ur urgency says that we have to, we have to get on with the heat pump rollout um, no matter what. Any, does anybody else want to answer that, um, speak to that? Laura? Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on something uh, Nicola Terry had said earlier in the chat. Um, and when I was talking about my blockers on the poll, this is not one thing that I brought up, but it's a good point. People think hydrogen will solve the problem without them doing anything. And that's a big risk. You know, you're just talking about the risk there. And if we 
if everybody seems to go down the path of what they're um what some uh, gas boiler fitters are saying which is just don't worry you just wait you can have a hydrogen ready boiler and you know just wait for hydrogen to become available if that becomes the the message that goes out we won't do anything at all and we'll just be here in eight years time nine years time and nothing will have happened so you know as, as jan says we have technology that works now we need to deploy it now we can't hang around so um let's just get on with it so is there a danger in the hydrogen messaging that's coming out? I mean, it's really fabulous news that these, these, these test beds are being done and there's, there's these demonstrator projects. It's fantastic. But I heard on the BBC them, them you know, talking about it and then at the very tail end of it saying, you know, it, it sounding as though it was the answer and, and a panacea, but actually at the end saying, you know, it's expected that about 11% of homes in the UK will be heated by hydrogen by whatever date. Um, and it was, but it's being positioned as the as the catch all, and, and and in fact not as a not as a top up or a, a, a partial thing. Is is that perhaps part of the issue? If I may come in there, there Pippa. So um, in terms of the danger, I, I do think genuinely that that hydrogen has been used by some as a delay a delay tactic, um, and I think that's ethically really questionable. Um, if, if these organisations, whoever they are, and I won't name anyone, were really concerned about the climate emergency, they'd be doing everything they can to promote the technologies that we know can work, which are energy efficiency, heat networks and heat pumps. Um, and I, I've got a specific concern around hydrogen ready boilers, which um, may be mandated at some point. What, one of those is that I think it, it allows the appliance manufacturers, some of whom we know are very keen on hydrogen, just because it doesn't, it means not doing anything, just to say, we've done our bit now, we're waiting for everyone else to do theirs when they know how compl complicated and complex the whole thing is. Um, and I think secondly, if there is this push towards hydrogen, it potentially affects the public narrative to a point which is unhelpful. Um, when everyone's saying or, or when the majority of analysis is saying it can only really play a very niche cost effective role at the moment um, and people suddenly think oh it, it is it can do everything and they don't have to do anything uh, much more intrusive like having a heat pump. John I'm on my back now. You're back you're back. Um, so I didn't catch all of what Richard was saying, but I, I think I, I would sort of agree agree with a lot of it um, on this sort of hydrogen ready boilers point. Um, what does hydrogen ready mean? Actually, when I dug into some of these hydrogen ready boilers, it means that they can take 20 percent um, hydrogen, um, which to my mind is nothing like hydrogen ready. That's what any boiler should be able to do at the moment anyway. Um, so, you know, there is an issue there. The other point, I think, is that um, you know, if you are, if we do end up with a major rollout of hydrogen, that's not really going to start in earnest before 2035 at the earliest. Um, by the time you've actually sort of finished trials and sort of start building capacity, etc. Um, so you know, there is another generation, even if a heat pump lasts for 15 years, put it in now, and you know the question around hydrogen will be, you know, a state, you know, the next generation replacement, not the one you're replacing at the moment. So I think, you know, the key point at the moment is how can you make a difference today? And that's where I think, you know, hydrogen is not on the table at the moment. I mean, certainly the government is not turning around saying this is about to appear or saying delay. Um, but as, you know, Richard has pointed out, you know, I think there is the sort of the messaging that hydrogen is nice and simple and it's going to appear tomorrow. And you might as well um, wait until then, which is not very satisfactory for, for anyone, really. And that's perhaps the biggest, biggest risk that we're facing at the moment. That does sound like a very big risk, because that's the message that's coming in loud and clear from virtually every quarter, that it's almost like, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't worry, um, hurry up and wait for hydrogen. It, 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 it's the panacea. So um, pushing that over then perhaps to Amy and Laura, how do does the decentralized energy message and how does the heat pump message get out to consumers? How do we change this? How do we how do we displace the hydrogen message sufficiently? Which of you? Yeah, go for it, Laura. Okay, Laura. Um, well, there's loads of different ways we can get that out. As I, as I said uh, in my presentation, ten, a year ago, people were still had this idea of, well, this, this, this question about, you know, well, what's a heat pump? I've never heard of it. 
the, there is a slight difference now in saying, well, how can I have a heat pump? How can it work in my house? So there's certainly in a very short space of time, the, the conversation has changed for many people. Um, there's still obviously a lot of people out there who either A, haven't heard of heat, heat pumps or B, are thinking there's no way I'm going to have a, have a heat pump. I want to stay with my gas boiler. Um, but there are things that we are trying to do now. Um, you know, we, we, we're fortunate in that there's a lot of um, groups such as the ADE, such as GSHPA, such as MCS, who are coming together to give um, to, to give a message out there. Uh, for example, we're working with MCS to put together um, a, 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 a basically a document that can go out to people like Citizens Advice and Energy Savings Trust that explain very clearly what a heat pump is in very ordinary, easy to understand terms, trying to explain what the myths are and how they can be overcome and why they're not correct. Um, so this is all about engaging the consumer and it is going to be quite difficult because if people are not engaged with their energy use then why would they even be looking into it so we've got to try and work with the people who are interested and I like the idea like for example where I live there are a few people who live nearby who are quite interested in heat pumps and bringing together like small community groups that then talk to their neighbours and say, oh, you know, I'm having, I, I'm thinking about having a heat pump fitted and, you know, spreading the message that way. So it's almost like ground roots stuff, trying to tap into the ground roots, uh, people who are interested and then letting them spread the word themselves, evangelise basically. But also from the top end, spreading it downwards by enabling people to find information. Things like webinars as well, you know, things like this online, people can access, they can access YouTube videos and things like that if they want to. But it's engaging, I think the difficult one is engaging people who are not interested full stop. But isn't the point of purchase when you say to the gas man, this boiler is failing, is it worth repairing? What shall I do? And they say, no, nah, don't worry, wait for hydrogen. Have we not, are they not the, 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 the defining stakeholders in this? Because they, they make the recommendation and you're relying on them to go off and get the bits and come back and, uh, you know, at least sort of guide you in the journey. Is there not a conflict of interest there, perhaps? Amy, did you want to say anything on that? I can say. Yeah, I, I think um, everything that I agree with everything that Laura was saying on that point, but I, I think as well, it's important to realise that different groups of consumers will have different routes to engage with this. And actually, not all consumers will want to particularly engage with them um, with how they get their energy. I think the important thing to get across in that case is that um, getting to net zero and, and retrofitting at the scale that we need to will involve some level of disruption for everyone essentially, but yet that will deliver a better solution in the long term. And then that comes back to Richard's point about improved comfort and living conditions. And so I think it's tailoring the message for different groups of people. Um, your point about the gas boiler installers and getting um, further down the supply chain, and that's something that um, we're looking at, uh, particularly with the Heat Networks Industry Council, is how, the, how we can engage people who are further down the supply chain and actually on the ground telling people these are the options for you in terms of retrofit and making sure they they have, you know, SMEs, for example, have opportunities um, to get the skills and training to move into low carbon sectors. So, um, yeah, I agree with everything Laura was saying, but just um, that there's nuance based on different groups of consumers. OK, thank you. Thank you. Now, this would not be a climate emergency event without a question from Bill Bordas. So I'm going to just pop that out there now. This is a quick fire to each of you to just sort of, you know, a, a, a quick reply to heat networks can be most uh, are most cost effective as local monopolies, but government likes choice and competition. Can these be made compatible? Thoughts, please. Shall I, shall I just quick fire around in the order I see you on my screen? Richard, can these be made compatible? Choice and competition versus a local monopoly. Can I say two things, please, Pippa? Yes. One is that solving climate change is more important than competition. Um, and, and secondly, you can introduce elements of competition into heat networks, but they fundamentally are going to have one owner of the infrastructure. Um, and it's going to be quite difficult to get around that. Yeah. And, and, and the holy grail of consumer choice does have to go out the window for some of these local networks, I believe. But my experience is they didn't really want much of it anyway. Um, Amy, you're next on my screen. What, what do you think? Local monopolies versus choice and competition? Yeah, I think, I mean, heat networks by nature are sort of natural monopolies and there's no real way of getting around that. 
but uh, through regulation that's uh, proposing to introduce price controls and also um, engage with consumers when they actually move into a property so that they're clear about what they're getting themselves into when they move into a heat network. So I think that's important. And then potentially as we move to electrified systems, it might be possible that at least consumers can change their electricity supplier. Um, and I think there's work being done in that space. Uh, but yeah, I think to some extent they are just natural monopolies. Laura, anything um, to add? Uh, I, I guess the only thing to add is that somebody, uh, uh, Dom and Dom Barton and Amy have talked about regulation. So it's all about protecting the consumer. Okay, it will be a not monopoly, uh, but it's all about how is the consumer protected from being overcharged and the heat network underperforming because they can't swap. Okay, yes. They, they will be tied in and therefore it has to be a very, very fair deal with, with boundaries and constraints um, and regulatory um, gu guidelines. Okay, Jan, you're next on my screen. Well, I'm not sure there is an awful lot of competition right now between technologies. You know, when I look at uh, houses on my street, um, the only house that is not connected to the gas grid is my own because I disconnected um, uh, and, and everybody else on the gas grid. And I don't think people think about, oh, what are the other options? You know, maybe I could install a heat pump. Maybe I could have a biomass boiler or maybe I could do something else entirely. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm not sure whether actually there's such a desire from people to have lots and lots of options. I think what will help them is actually have a bit more clarity and, and it needs to be cost effective. Yeah, it, it needs to be um, affordable, I think that is important and reliable, but whether or not you can have um, five different options for heating, I'm not sure it's actually that important in, in that particular um, instance, because most people are not that interested in the heating system at all, as long as it works. I, th I think it, it, it's more about the, the supplier, the monopoly on the supplier, moving away from the sort of you know, British gas scenario to, to, to having sort of competition, tariff competition, etc. And of course, with, with a, net, a, a local monopoly, of a network, they don't have the option of changing. If that's a holy grail, they, the government will have to give up. Perhaps John could answer that. Well, I think in the longer term, you know, pe you know that one of the concepts of heat networks is that you have much bigger heat networks. And at that point, you end up with, you know, I mean, in a similar way we've got with the gas system at the moment, there's only one person who's actually putting the pipe into your home. It's just other people are putting the, the gas into the pipe in effect. Well, if you've got a much larger heat network, then you can have multiple people who are putting heat into that heat network and you can choose to buy your heat from you know, several potential different heat suppliers, um, which is going down, down the same pipes. The problem we've got at the moment is heat networks tend to be on a very small scale. And um, you know, therefore you are into what is a, sort of a natural monopoly. And as already pointed out, the answer to that is regulation and sort of competition, lots sort of markets authorities sort of saying what's reasonable. But you know, I think you know, you, you know, I think this is a government that's recognizing that you know regulation is not bad. There are there are times when actually there is a time and a place for regulation. This may may well be one of them, and the market doesn't always work. Well, this is a, that, that's, a, that's a really, really good point for me to end on, because what you're really saying is we have to do it bigger to make it better for heat for heat um, networks to work. If we if we make them big, we go big, then you've got the, the competition. If they're small, very micro um, things, then there's no competition. People get tied into them. So the answer here, folks, is we have to go big. We have to do it. So um, as easy as that. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Andy Ford. I think it's it, it's um, coming to the end of the um, session. We, we, we've still got a surprising number of people. For the fact that we're, we're after five o'clock on a Thursday, um, I'm amazed how many people are still here, and we're really grateful for that. We will be sending out um, slides. We will be um, sending out a video of the event um, and putting that up on YouTube. Um, Andy, can I hand over to you to summarise um, what your, your thoughts and findings are before I close the show? Andy, are you there? He's there. I'm here. I'm here. Hello. Ah, oh, I've been listening to that uh, 
I'm desperate to say thanks, but it's been really good. Thank you, all of you. That has been such an interesting conversation. I, I'm, I'm so glad that that's taken place. Um, we will come back to it uh, again. Um, and there's various things that we're definitely going to take forward. Um, I've been designing buildings since I was in my 20s, and I started with district heating systems. So I've been doing that for quite a long time. Uh, I, I decided once upon a time that the idea was that we just got rid of all building services and we're moving that way in, um, in, in new build. We built quite a lot of very successful, extremely comfortable buildings. And <laughs> John, I think the best thing I heard out of this all this, it just feels lovely. So that is the ultimate aim, okay. I do think personally that there's a difference between getting to the point where everybody lives in a house where they just feel lovely and fully decarbonizing our heating systems. And I don't think these things should be connected too closely together. I know not everybody will agree with me, but there we go. Uh, the business of raising the, getting the correct public narrative I think that's come out of that very, very strongly. We really have to get that public narrative out there properly. Um, I'm about to, um, in the next couple of weeks, I have to present to uh, another group of people, the Higher Education Design Quality Forum, okay? So they're, they're all run universities. I would like to, if people could give me some ideas, because I'm really interested in this, they are asking a question is, what role do universities have in this? Now, most universities have district systems of some sort. They also have technology people within them. And that is true of district systems. They tend to have people who run them with knowledge. It's not true in our own homes generally, even though I may be sitting in my own home and might be quite good at fiddling with things, but that isn't a normal situation everywhere else. So I'm interested in knowing the expertise which comes, for instance, from London South Bank University, where we train up to 50% of the building services engineers in the country and have done for years. That knowledge is out there. How do we use that knowledge effectively to rapidly change the situation around the place? I was shocked by the comments about the undersizing of heating systems. Quite frankly, the scale of poor design is terrible and there shouldn't be like that. It has to be overcome. This is also a thing that we must get right this time round. And this time round is actually 30 years, I accept. So anyway, thank you very much, all of you, for a really fascinating discussion. Uh, I look forward to something serious happening about this. Anyway, that's it, Pippa. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Andy. I think one of the things that's really interesting about the climate emergency debates or, or event series that we have is that every single time something really, really interesting comes out, we have very interesting discussions, interesting research, interesting knock-on effects and things that people come back and tell us are happening in their world. So I think all of the panelists can expect it to, to, to be approached or, or, or um, chased by various members of, of the audience and, and organizations, et cetera, who've heard you speak. Um, I think it sounds very much as though we need to start thinking as a sector what that public messaging sounds like and, and perhaps unify around the, the messaging and the improving the PR piece for, for heat pumps, etc. There, there's, there's perhaps discussions there as well. Um, there is movement, isn't there? There's definitely movement. Laura, you've said several times, you know, there, there's, there's undoubtedly movement going on. We know we have a heat strategy coming shortly. We know we have a heat strategy coming shortly. I say that with full confidence that something will materialize soon. Um, the world is very much changing and we have the know-how and we have the expertise and we do know what the solutions are. So I think um, it takes a long time to sort of go through all the comments and start to sort of analyze what's been said. But we are enormously grateful to all our panelists who have appeared here today. John for, for um, approaching us and suggesting we, 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 we talk about this issue again and talk about it in a different way. And I think that's been such a useful steer. 
um, Jan and Richard for showing up again um, because they were at our first heat seminar and it was very useful again to, to, there's so much expertise there it's almost impossible to, to, to um, get it you know even even start to see um, what we're dealing with and to Amy and Laura for coming along today and giving your different perspectives really really valuable we're coming to a close. Thank you to the audience for staying with us. We will be mailing everybody. We'll be telling you about our next event, which I haven't even mentioned, which is going to be about embodied carbon, hoping to, to, to be pulling that together in September. And we're, we're very, very interested in, in whole of life and embodied carbon. It's massively important to the sector with the scale of retrofit, the scale of new build that we're looking at and the technologies. So we will be back to um, emailing you opt in there's a job form on the chat opt in if you haven't already because i'm not allowed to talk to you unless you say i can um, but these conversations are so critical and we are hugely grateful to richard jan john amy and laura and andy for coming along today and sharing your expertise thank you and we will sign off now goodbye